All right, I think we are live. So hopefully you guys can all hear me okay. Please give me a thumbs up if you can. And hopefully uh, we have another flawless live stream like the past few. We haven't had any technical glitches. So I hope you guys are all having a good start to your 2021 here so far. Um, it's uh, time just keeps on flying, thankfully. Hopefully we'll get into some better times here in the spring and the summer. But I hope all of you are holding up okay with the rough times that we currently have. Um, so yeah, I see we already have a few people here. Good to see uh, some of you, Vayetzi. Thank you for hanging out. We have uh, Sam and Fastline, Key West. Sam, thank you all for, for hanging out. Happy New Year to all of you. And uh, we have Jazz here. Thanks for joining. Dom, thanks for joining as well. And uh, so yeah, um, you guys can fire away with questions if you want. Otherwise, I can give you a quick little update here on um, the channel. I'm sure many of you watched the uh, year-end video and my wrap-up and stuff, which kind of went over all my plans here for you know the year going forward and stuff. But um, so yeah, I you probably just saw I was in the uh, Toyota Venza this past week, and um, that was a nice vehicle, very just comfortable cruiser. It's kind of nice, you know, just having something that's just relaxed. It isn't super sporty all the time, just to cruise around in comfort. Um, um, but Hyundai will be sending me the new Elantra here this week. So that'll be another one to do. Unfortunately, it's not the N-Line version. So um, it's just going to be the normal limited version or whatever. But be nice to try out the new Elantra. Hopefully, we'll have the N-Line in the spring once we can have the sportier tires on it and stuff like that. Um, so I'm excited for that. And um, yeah, that's about it. So uh, hopefully, you guys can all hear me OK. I haven't seen anyone say otherwise. So hopefully, we're all good. Um, so we'll get to the first question here. Uh, Key West Sunset says, Matt, I live in Northeast and want a Mustang. Should I wait until next year for the rumored all-wheel drive Mustang? I don't know if it's going to be this time next year. Uh, I think, you know, the next generation Mustang, from everything that I've seen, all the leaks and stuff, uh, I think the most telling was there was a LinkedIn job posting, actually, which was talking about the next generation Mustang and someone uh, that was working on that or something. And I believe they said that it was going to be coming for the 2024 model year, so 2023 calendar year. So, um, you know, you're probably looking at at least two years, maybe a year and a half if they really launch it early. Um, but, you know, by the time it's actually in dealers and stuff, you're looking at at least two years, I think. And then I don't know if it's going to actually have all-wheel drive, you know, at launch or I really don't know. I mean, you know, they've been hinting that like they'd like to do an all-wheel drive Mustang for a little while now with the Challenger and stuff, you know, having the all-wheel drive. But I don't know if that's going to be something they're going to do. I mean, they could maybe work it into this current generation, but to do all that work for one model year wouldn't make sense. So I'm thinking it's at least two years out, probably a little bit more. I wouldn't wait. If you really want um, a muscle car with all wheel drive, I would suggest going for a Challenger in the meantime, just for the next couple of years and then swap over to the Mustang if that does arrive. Um, but otherwise it's really hard to say. I wish I knew. Um, but yeah, I mean, if nothing else, you can get the Mach-E. If you consider that a real Mustang, you can always get one of those to have an all wheel drive Mustang uh, here right now. I think there's people starting to get their deliveries here pretty soon. So um, yeah. Um, other questions here. We have fear. No one says, what did you get for Christmas? Uh, a bunch of stuff, got some clothes, got, um, you know, a couple little knickknacks. I got a few vintage, uh, posters, uh, my in-laws uh, got for me that they find at uh, flea markets and stuff like that. It's always kind of cool. So I'm, I'm collecting things to decorate my next weekly update office. So I'm hoping to move this year and uh, hoping to, you know, actually have a more fun set for the weekly updates and stuff. So I have a bunch of signs I've been collecting. I have a bunch of model cars um, that I've had in storage for a while because I didn't really want to do too much in this house because this was always going to be just a stepping stone kind of temporary house for, you know, it was like a five-year plan kind of house. So didn't do a ton of stuff to this house, but, uh, you know, once we move, hopefully get a bunch of stuff put up and, uh, you know, have a little bit more customization and have a little bit more fun for the backdrop and, and all that. And hopefully that'll also I'll have enough stuff that not only will that wall, which you guys are currently not seeing is where the weekly update is filmed, but this wall behind me, maybe have some more fun stuff. Although this sign that my friend made me a couple years ago is super cool. And I definitely will plan to keep using that, but otherwise, um, you know, going to hopefully have some more fun backdrops. Cause I know that's something that is sorely lacking right now. You see like a door, and bare walls and that's it. So not, not too much fun there. Um, and uh, I also got a snow scraper, uh, my wife pointed out because that was another thing. Um, believe it or not, I didn't, I was actually sharing Beth's snow scraper from her car and I didn't have my own for a while for whatever reason. I just never bought one because um, we just had the one and that was fine. But um, 
I needed to get a new one. And so now I have a very nice, large foam one that, you know, gets all the snow off. Cause like cleaning the snow off of that Kia Sorento, whenever we got like a foot of snow a few weeks ago, was a lot of work. So now I got an awesome snow scraper. So that's good. Um, and a bunch of other little things. Hopefully you guys had a good Christmas as well. Uh, all right. So Sam's asking eighth gen or ninth gen Civic SI. I don't remember which generation is which off the top of my head. I always have to look up like which one is the eighth and which one is the ninth. Um, I think that I personally, though, I like the previous generation more than the current generation. I'm really excited for the next generation we just saw. Um, but I think the VTEC, you know, uh, motor in the, you know, 2014 was the last model year for that one. I think uh, that is still my favorite Civic SI. And if I were to own one, that would be the generation I would go with for sure. But I see we have a few uh, super chats. I forgot to mention at the beginning, like other live streams, if you're new to this, um, I always give priority to the super chat questions and then try and get to everyone else's as best I can. But first off, huge thanks to Tear, Tear Blood. Thank you so much for the very generous super chat. He says, Yo, Match is showing support. Love the channel. Also hoping to get my luxury car this year. Any suggestions? Um, it all kind of depends on what you prefer and what you like. If you ask my wife, she would say Mercedes C300 is the best pick you could have. Um, if you ask me, I think that the C300 also is a very good pick, but there's a lot of other good stuff as well. You have the Genesis G70, which I really enjoyed this past year. Uh, if you want something a little sportier, I really love the Cadillac CT5V. I think that's kind of a an overlooked uh, entry into the segment that I think was just such a good driving vehicle. Um, I really love the Acura TLX. That was one of the most comfortable vehicles we drove in 2020. And even Beth agreed, it was like insanely comfortable. She loved riding in that car. And so um, I think if it were my money, uh, the TLX would probably be towards the top of my list. Um, I think the Kia Stinger GT, if you consider that luxury, since I know it doesn't have a luxury brand attached to it, but Stinger GT is also something in that price range that I would consider very strongly just because it has the great hatch practicality, lots of power, has the all-wheel drive option, has lots of comfort as well. And I think it looks pretty cool as well. And this year, they're going to have all kinds of new stuff for the Stinger. It's going to have an active exhaust, a couple more horsepower. There's the new four-cylinder turbo version, which is doing like 300 horsepower now instead of the 250 it did previously. Um, all kinds of good stuff. Um, so really just comes down to what your preferences are. And for anyone who ever has any questions about car shopping or anything, I do also answer uh, messages on Facebook. If you send me a message there, I try and get back to you as quickly as I can to really, you know, if you give me a lot of context as far as what you're looking for, what your price range is, what you don't want, what you need, I can really help, you know, kind of fine tune my suggestions to make them, you know, better for your individual situation. Because it's not really a one size fits all kind of thing, of course, you know, it's always something that's best to custom tailor to what your lifestyle is and what your needs are. Um, Kays Nino, thank you so much for the uh, super chat as well. He says, keep up the great vids, Matt. I appreciate all of you for continuing to watch them. Um, I know you guys have lots of great options these days for car reviews and car videos. And so to continue to watch my stuff, I really, really appreciate it. So I'll keep making them as long as everyone keeps watching them. Uh, Moon, thank you so much for the super chat as well. He says, hi, Matt, which manufacturer do you think deserves kudos for most improved from 2019 to 2020? I think the one that really stands out in my mind, um, well, I guess, honestly, it's a combination of Genesis, Hyundai, and Kia. I think every single time I get in one of those vehicles, it's usually pretty close to best in class. It's always very impressive. The value is always there, but it's also more than just a value thing with those brands now. You know, they're, yes, they have the long warranties and stuff, but they're also just really good to drive. They're, you know, high tech. They have, you know, nicer materials than they had in the past. I think they've really improved a lot in all of them. I think between the three, I think Genesis, obviously, you know, they kind of were sticking with the same thing for the past five years. And then now, you know, this past year, they've had all this new stuff come out. And I'm hoping to get the G80 and the GV80 here in the next few weeks to review for you guys as well. Cause I know I've been way behind everyone else has already reviewed that. I'm still itching to get into those. So I'm hoping to get those because that seems like an enormous leap from even the Genesis stuff from last year. So I'm excited for that. Um, I think also Nissan, I know everyone loves to beat up on Nissan <laughs> every single time I, the word Nissan comes out, comes out of my mouth. It's like, well, CVT, CVT and Scotty Kilmer and all this other stuff. And so, um, yes, I know that Nissan CVTs have been problematic in the past. They could very well continue to be problematic in the future. I don't know. I review mostly new cars. I, you know, don't have a crystal ball, but what I can say is that their interiors are really starting to be some of the, uh, you know, very competitive, if not the best in class, they are right up there with the top. Um, and they're very, very good. And so I think they're another one that I think companies should keep an eye on, even if 
you know, they don't sell a ton because people are scared about the reliability. I mean, they're putting out some really impressive interiors and, uh, you know, other companies could benefit from, you know, kind of seeing what Nissan has done right and kind of, you know, integrate some of those things, retaining the volume in two knobs, having touch screens, which Mazda continues to refuse to do, um, you know, just nicer materials, more padding than others and stuff like that, I think is, you know, stuff that a lot of others could uh, copy and benefit from. But Anyway, I think those are probably the ones that stand out in my mind the most. So, but thank you again for the super chat. Um, all right, so we have um, Noob Wheeler says he just had a GV80 behind me today and they look luxe. Yeah, I have not actually seen one on the streets yet. And I don't think I've actually ever seen one in person still because there was no auto shows this past year to go to or anything. So yeah, I don't think I've actually ever seen one in person still. And uh yeah, I'm looking forward to hopefully seeing them. But uh, yeah, that's awesome. It looked good in person because sometimes, you know, it looks better in pictures or worse in pictures, but I'm glad to hear that it looks good out in the uh, in the open as well. Um, LN88 says, hi, Matt. Any idea or thoughts when orders or production of the C8Z06 will begin? Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you as well. Um, you know, I, I haven't been staying super up to date on all the rumors and stuff. I mean, I've you know been obviously keeping track of it for the weekly updates. Uh, but I think the Corvette community is a little bit, you know, closer to, uh, you know, all those sources and stuff. But from what I remember hearing, it was still supposed to come this year. I don't know exactly when this year, um, you know, COVID has kind of pushed everything back with the Corvette timeline a little bit. But I think it should be arriving maybe by this summer. I don't know though. I think it's still kind of up in the air and it kind of depends on how everything goes here for the next six months as well, as far as, you know, if we go back into lockdowns and things get stricter again, or if they, you know, if you know things get better with the vaccine that helps everything to, you know, get better. I'm not sure how things are going to play out with that, but I think, um, you know, especially since there was a delay rollout for the C8s last year, you know, there's just you know, now starting to get the court, the uh, convertible versions rolled out a little bit more and stuff. I'm hoping that we get a Z06, but this whole year is going to be kind of a complete wild card as far as, you know, what ends up arriving on time, what ends up being late. We already saw the Bronco, for example, was pushed back. That was supposed to be starting to arrive here like now. And now they're saying it's going to be like midsummer. I think they're going to production in May, but they're not actually going to start delivering them to dealers until like July or something. So, you know, you have that kind of stuff delayed and if the bronco which ford i guarantee you is working as hard as possible to get out as fast as they possibly can if that's being pushed back you know six months i wouldn't be surprised if the z06 ends up getting launched in the middle of winter next you know this coming year here so it might be 12 months out or something i hope it's not i hope it comes sooner because it's it's really gonna be such a sweet package from everything that you know we've seen so far so i'm hoping that uh, we get uh, you know that a little bit sooner than later. But anyway, thank you so much for the question. Uh, Vietzi, thank you so much for the super chat here. He says, I appreciate you keeping it real about the self-driving tech and how it'll change in the next few years. Few in the automotive space critique it. Yeah, you know, I think there's there's like the there's some people that are on the side of, well, I don't want them. So they kind of shoot it down on that side. Then you have like the tech industry and, and that whole thing, which is like, oh, like it's here right now. Like Tesla's are doing it right now. And it's like, well, that's not really fully uh, developed still, you know? So I think, I don't know. It's like everything else. I call it how I see it. Unless the thing is, you know, smarter than I am and it's doing everything perfectly, it's not really going to be self-driving. And, um, and yeah, it's, you know, in my reviews, I try and remind people of that a lot because there are so many people that sensationalize stuff for headlines and stuff, especially in the tech industry. And so, you know, whenever I'm doing, you know, my reviews, uh, you know, I want to test that kind of stuff. And like I said, in the uh, Genesis G90, you know, review that they're highway driving assist, they really play up. And in reality, it, it doesn't really work that great, at least in my experience. I've been, I know there's been other uh, reviewers that have had a fantastic time with highway drive assist. It's been like amazing. And, you know, so I don't know why there's differences between car and car. Uh, but, you know, yeah, with that one, for example, it was not, not as good as I was expecting it to be. But there's some that are better. Like Honda doesn't really play up their system that much, but I think they have one of the best steering assists out there. I mean, that system feels, it actually felt better than autopilot in some ways. Because like the Honda system is like you're on rails when you put that uh, lane keep assist on and they don't play that up. They're just like, yeah, it's got lane keep assist, but like it's one of the best ones out there. So it's kind of funny how there's those <laughs> polar opposites sometimes. Uh, Michael Earl says thoughts on the current Subaru Outback. Um, I like the Outback. I did a review on the XT version. It was really good. Um, I think the only thing is that 
I just don't love their CVT still. That is my problem with any Subaru is that CVT is honestly probably one of my least favorite transmissions in the automotive industry currently. I mean, even Nissan CVT, which I know some people say is the same old one, but it's just been retuned. Whatever it is, it feels better. I just care about the feeling of the CVT and Nissan CVT feels way more natural than the Subaru one. I know you can ignore the CVT and you get used to it. You get used to anything. I mean, you can get used to riding a bike too, but it doesn't mean that it's great or it's competitive. And in my opinion, the Subaru CVT just is still one of the like older feeling ones. It just feels kind of mushy and, and not great, but uh, there's others that also aren't great either. It's not just Subaru. I'm, you know, wanting to beat up on or anything, but uh but other than that, I think it's fantastic. If they offered it with a manual, it'd be like an easy recommendation in my book. Because otherwise, I thought it was really solid. Um, it's just that CVT is a little iffy. Um, Garrett Benz, thank you so much for the very generous super chat as well. He says, hi, Matt. Just popping in to say hi and support the channel. Your review helped me decide to buy my 2021 Veloster N six-speed manual. That's awesome. Congrats on that. Loving it so far. Take care. Stay safe. And congrats to you and Beth for the baby on the way. I really appreciate that, man. Um, and congrats on the Veloster. And that is, uh, I'm so thankful that so many of you buy so many awesome cars because that's what keeps it going, especially to buy this stuff new. That's what sends the message to the manufacturers that they need to keep building them because, you know, Hyundai doesn't make any money off of a Veloster N that's used. You know, they, they make money off of new ones. That's their signal. And once it's off the, the new car lot, they don't care what happens to it, you know? So, I mean, it's awesome that, that you bought that. And uh, yeah, I'm hoping to get the Veloster N dual clutch here at some time this spring to review as well. I know some people have already been able to review it in places that are a little bit warmer and the weather's cooperating, but it doesn't make any sense here in Pittsburgh with freezing temperatures to get a summer tire car. So, um, you know, I'm going to be kind of limited on that kind of stuff till it warms up some more, but um, I'm excited for the DCT version, but the manual is the way I would get one as well. Even though there's some cool toys with the new DCT, I would go for the stick. And that still is potentially a dad car in the running if I do end up needing a dad car, which I don't think I will. But if I do find myself needing an extra car, um, Veloster and is still high on my list because it still has an actual kind of back seat. You have a nice deep hatch in that, so you could you know throw a stroller in there or something. Um, I love the Veloster N so much. That was such a fun car to have for a week. So I must be awesome to have one, uh, you know, all the time. So yeah, congrats on that. And thank you so much for the support too. Hamburger One Hour Loops, thank you so much for the uh, super sticker here. I really appreciate it. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them and I'll try and try and find them here. But uh, all right, so uh, Mr. Uh, Big Rick says, plot twist, the BMW M3 CS that we had since April 2019 isn't my mom's nor my dad's, it's actually mine. That's awesome. Uh, congrats on having an M3 CS. That's a sweet, sweet car. Um, those things are wild. I mean, I just did the regular competition M3 of the old, you know, current generation. And that was a blast. I'm hoping to maybe review the new ones. I'm trying to work on getting some BMW press cars here. That would be something that would be nice. Cause I know that's one enthusiast brand that, you know, has been kind of missing on the channel because I just um, haven't had, you know, the opportunities to review too many of them, but I'm hoping to get some more of those here this year. We'll see what 2021 brings. Um, and Matt Moss says, no, Matt, dad car must be the RDX. RDX is also in the running. If I need more space than what you know, Velocitaran offers, I just kind of have to wait and see how everything plays out. I'm hoping to not have to get a third car, even though it's always fun to car shop and have more cars. Just from a money standpoint, I think I'll be able to get by on the press cars and uh, Beth C300. Um, but Hamburger One Hour Loops, thank you so much for another super chat here. He says, what do you think of cars from Yugoslavia? Um, honestly, all I know is the Yugo, uh, which is terrible. I'm probably terribly uncultured, but um I know, I just know very little from, you know, like the Top Gear episodes way back in the day where they, uh, they did some of those like Cold War era vehicles and stuff, but I don't know about any of the new stuff or, you know, what's even offered there, unfortunately. So um, I'm sorry for my ignorance. I'm an ignorant American uh, and, and I don't uh, know anything about Yugoslavia cars, but um, yeah, feel free to send me a message anytime um, about them. Yeah, I've, like you say, 2000s. Zastavas or Yugos. Yeah, I, I definitely know the Yugos. They kind of have a reputation here in the States as being um, probably one of the more lemony cars of the Malays era of the uh, 70s and 80s and stuff. But 
I've never heard of the other brand you mentioned there. Um, but, but yes, I will have to look into it. I honestly didn't know that they made their own cars, which is probably terrible. I should do some research. Uh, see, even as someone who's you know reviewed over almost 500 cars at this point, I still have plenty to learn. So I'll definitely check that out. Thanks for the uh, enlightenment. Um, Aiden Thomas says, I was thinking about buying a Volvo XC90 T8. Any other recommendations? Um, I really like the T8. I think it's obviously very unique in its offering of having a plug-in hybrid because um, I think, I don't know, I always get confused what ones are offered in the States and which ones are offered in Europe because I know Europe has a bunch of plug-in hybrid luxury, you know, through rows and stuff. But I think here in the States, that still might be the only one unless they started offering the X7 with the plug-in already. I don't know when that was supposed to come. But anyway, yeah, I love the XC90. I know I had one for a week and you probably saw that video this past year. Um, I think they're great vehicles. I love that Volvo is super safe as well. That is something that as someone who's had two freak accidents happen <laughs> to them in cars, um, I value safety and I really love Volvo for how much they value that as well. So I think that's that's probably really good. I just, the T8 thing, that was a little bit of a disappointment. I wish there was a little bit more electric range. I wish the electric motor was a little more powerful, um, you know, and so it just get, comes down to, I guess, how much you value that plug-in hybrid functionality as well. Because if you're, if you don't really care about that and you just want 400 horsepower, the BMW X7, you know, I reviewed that, although that was the M50i version or whatever, but, um, you know, even the six cylinder version is very strong. It's a great, you know, three row luxury crossover. The Mercedes GLS is probably um, one of the most luxurious in that segment and, you know, blows the Volvo out of the water as far as toys and, um, you know, just everything you can get in it. But that's another one that's, you know, very, you know, much worth considering. Um, and those are probably the top three. I can't think of any others off the top of my head that, uh, that I would really recommend. The Q7 is kind of dated at this point. Um, yeah. But anyway, all right. Uh, moving on here, we have um, Corey says, are you guys planning on staying in Pittsburgh? We are. Um, yeah, we'll be staying in Pittsburgh for the foreseeable future. It's where all of our family and friends are. So um, I really love Pittsburgh, you know, for the most part. It's a great city. And uh, so, yeah, we'll be here probably forever. We'll have to wait and see, though. There's a uh, It'd be fun to have, you know, a, different, a second house someday if we're ever that well off, but uh, that's just a complete pipe dream at this point. But um, all right, so we have um, Yad here says, hey, Matt, try to get a BMW X5M. I would love to hear your opinion on it. I'd love to review one of those as well. You know, I did do the X6M, I don't know, it was like two or three years ago, but that was kind of like the previous generation version. Um, but they're very impressive, those large BMW, you know, beasts of SUVs. They're they're crazy. And uh yeah, I'd love to try out the new X5M. So we'll see if I can get those BMW press cars rolling in and get uh, get that would be awesome. So, um, all right. Uh, Danalogical says, uh, have you ever gotten close to an accident before or have? Um, so I have been in several accidents in my life. None of them were ever my fault and only two were while I was driving. So, um, yeah, the most recent ones, uh, some of you that have been watching the channel a little longer know that um, it was now about like two and a half years ago that I was driving through a park and a tree fell on the roof of my Mustang and um, came about that close to bashing in my head. Um, so that was pretty wild. And um, so that was on not the bullet, but on my one of my previous Mustangs, one out of the four. Um, and then also that same Mustang was sideswiped by a motorcycle about uh, 11 months earlier. And that was kind of wild because it was just like driving down a road at night and all of a sudden coming around a corner, some dude on a motorcycle going way too fast, uh, couldn't hold the corner very well and came into the oncoming lane and completely sideswiped and took out the entire side of my Mustang at 50 miles an hour. The side mirror got smacked into my face and everything else is all very dramatic and crazy. Um, so those are the only two where I was driving. I've been in other accidents as, as a kid and stuff. I was rear-ended uh, when I was like five years old. And there was another time where I was going through an intersection with my parents and we got T-boned and this was like in 1998 or something like that. So um, it's been a while uh, until the past two here with the Mustang. But other than that, it was usually a pretty rare thing. Um, but yeah, crazy stuff. Um Daniel says, please share the footage from getting pulled over. Um, okay, so I think you might be referring to, maybe it was in the last live stream, I did uh, a, a, I did a little thing where I was talking about how I was reviewing the G-Wagon um, about a year and a half ago in Washington and uh, got pulled over for that. Um, but that wasn't even like, I wasn't doing anything crazy. I was just being tailgated by a Toyota Corolla and sped up a little bit too much. Um, but I actually 
don't think the cameras were running at that point. I would have saved the footage if there was anything to show, uh, but all I have is the one picture, which I posted on my Instagram a long time ago of whenever it actually happened, but that was about it. I don't think I have any footage of that. Trust me, if I would have had something worth sharing, I would have just because it would have you know, made for a better video, but I don't think I have any footage of that, unfortunately. Uh, but thank you so much for the super chat, Daniel. Also, Moon, thank you so much for another super chat. He's, uh, he says, uh, or they say, I'm not sure what Moon, I don't know if you're uh, male, female, or um, something other than that, but um, you're saying when the Bronco was announced, there was a rumor that GMC might bring back the Jimmy. Have you heard anything since on that front? I haven't heard anything. I do remember the rumor you're talking about. And I think from what I remember, there was some people that got that mixed up with the Hummer, I think. I think there was talks of there being some kind of off-road GMC, and I think no one knew exactly what it was going to be called. They, I think, might have trademarked the Jimmy name, and that led to some rumors. So maybe there could still potentially be something out there, um, but from what I've seen... Um, I'm pretty sure GMC is going to have their hands full for the next few years with just doing the Hummer truck and then the Hummer SUV after that. And then there's going to be, I think the next GMC vehicle that's going to be, um, kind of new for the brand is going to be, you know, an electric Sierra to go along with the electric Silverado or whatever they end up calling those that could be called the Jimmy as well, because obviously we know GM has no respect for brands <laughs> since we have a blazer that's not very close to a blazer. We have a trailblazer. That's a far cry from the old trailblazer. So Jimmy could be anything. I don't know. But um, so, yeah, I, I don't know if they're going to actually do that or not. It would make 100% of sense for them to do some type of Wrangler competitor with the Jimmy. Um, you know, I just don't know. You know, GM's just going so full throttle into the electric thing that I don't know if there's any room for anything else that's not on that skateboard platform. And I don't know how well that skateboard platform would do with a smaller off-roader considering, you know, batteries are so heavy and stuff. So I don't know, but haven't heard anything new since then to answer your question. But um, yeah, I would love for them to do it, Jimmy. It'd be super cool. NG Nerd, uh, thank you so much for the super chat as well. He says, our RAV4 Prime is coming in soon. Very nice. Uh, but we recently tested and liked the Model Y more. Are we crazy to give up the RAV? Well, um, that's definitely going to come down to your lifestyle. Um, cause you know, if you watched my Tesla review, especially on the, um, model S that I did, um, you know, about a year ago or so, um, road tripping in a Tesla, it's the best road tripping vehicle. It's the best electric road tripping vehicle just because the supercharger network is better than all the other electric networks, but it still <clears throat> has a super inconvenient thing um i mean it was just a pain because you have to sit there way longer than you have to gas up and you know you might not think it's too bad until you're in a hurry and you're over the road trip and you're over the you know romanticism of oh we're on a road trip this is so cool and then you're like ah, i just want to get there whenever you're in the i just want to get there part is when the tesla gets most annoying because that's where it's like i just need to you know get here and i gotta stop and sit around for 40 minutes i've stopped enough i've eaten lunch three times i don't need to stop anymore so that's kind of the only thing. Now, if you never are going to road trip the car or if you're fine just renting a car to road trip in, which is, I think, what a lot of electric car people should do, um, I think with that, you know, you'll be totally, you know, you'll be fine to have the Model Y because I think the Model Y is cooler in some ways. But I think, yeah, it just totally comes down to what you're, what you're going to actually do with it. If you're never going to road trip, you know, Model Y could make more sense, but I think the RAV4 also is going to have better fit and finish, better reliability, most likely. Um, you have a Toyota dealer network, so you can get it serviced, you know, basically anywhere. You have no, um, you know, backups as far as like, you know, some people, if they get uh, and in, into an accident with their Tesla, I mean, there's been people that have been waiting like six months for a bumper. Um, I don't know if they've gotten some of that stuff fixed since, you know, the past year or so, but um, you know, that's been, it's been a huge headache for a bunch of people. And so, you know, that whole thing isn't great. So the customer support side of Tesla is still definitely lacking. And that's just because it's a new brand, I think, for the most part. Um, and that's something that obviously you, you don't have that issue with a Toyota. You can always get a RAV4 bumper, <laughs> you know, basically anywhere, probably. Um, so there's those types of things to consider as well. Um, but it totally, like I said, is going to come down to what you're looking for to do. Obviously, the Model uh, Y is going to be way faster. Um, you have the spaceship kind of feeling of it. You have all the fun rollouts and the fart noises and all that kind of stuff. So if all those types of things that you can get in a Tesla are exciting to you, then, you know, it could make a lot of sense. 
Um, I think it's a brilliant vehicle, the way that it's packaged and stuff, although I've not reviewed a Model Y. I've done the Model 3, which is basically the same thing, you know, mechanically. Um, but uh, if it were my money, I'd probably go RAV4 Prime for my own personal lifestyle and how I would use a vehicle. But yeah, totally, that comes down to how you're going to use it. Um, thank you again for the super chat. Um, we have a tear blood. Thank you so much for another super chat. He says, thanks for the suggestions, Matt. I am upset about the Lexus IS and rest in peace. Infinity top cars on my list are the three series, a four and a five Sportback. Um, all great cars. I think the three series is easily going to be the best handling car. So if that's something that you're into, um, I think that's great. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I think between those three, I'd probably go three series if those are your only ones you're considering. Uh, the A4s and the A5s are nice as well. I just feel like, I don't know. I just feel like Audi isn't hasn't really been the best in any uh, competitive segment in a while. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. I haven't reviewed a ton of Audis because that's another brand I don't get press cars of, but that doesn't really, I mean, I've still sat in them. I still see what the interiors are like. Um, you know, I just feel like they put a little bit less emphasis on driving dynamics in the non S and RS models than like BMW, which tries to make every three series, a good handling three series. So I think there's a little bit of that going on, but, um, you know, like I said, I don't have a ton of experience with the brand new A4 or A5. So I don't have quite as good of advice to give you there as some other reviewers might, but thank you so much again for the super chat and good luck deciding. And like I said, feel free to send me an email or a message if you're, um, you know, continuing to try and, you know, figure out what you're looking for. Um, Straight Ballin says, uh, Matt, uh, do you like the BRZ? <laughs> I love the BRZ. I'm excited for the new one here. It's uh, hoping I can maybe go get one to review here before the end of this year, you know, maybe the fall or something. That'd be awesome. But uh, it's been so hard for me to like, not like try and find a way to buy one because it just doesn't make sense. I can't justify it. But if I could justify it, I would totally have an order in for a new BRZ because I'm feeling nostalgic and would love to have that in addition to the bullet. Um, Bill Smith, thank you so much for the super chat as well. He says, used XT5 or used Stelvio. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Bill. Um, that also comes down to what you're looking for in the vehicle. If you're looking for the best handling SUV out of those two, Stelvio, hands down, I think is a fantastic handler, especially, especially if you get one with the Sport Package or the TI Sport Package. Um, and XT5, I actually have not reviewed. I've done everything but the XT5. I did the XT4, the XT6, um, but have not done the XT5. So I can't actually weigh in on how those drive. That's one of the few gaps I have that I have not covered. Um, but, you know, I think Cadillacs, especially used Cadillacs, are a pretty good value. Um, you know, I just don't think the X-T5 is ever really meant to be anything sporty. So if you just want something comfortable, the X-T5 is going to probably be the more soft, comfortable choice. And the Stelvio is going to definitely be the stiffer, more European-feeling, you know, vehicle um, and definitely the more fun choice, in my opinion. Uh, so it just comes down to what you're looking for. But hopefully that helps you. And thank you again for the super chat. Steven, thank you so much for the super chat. He says, thanks for doing these. See question if aviator okay. Um, so I will check out. I'll try and find your question here if I see anything pop up. But um, but the aviator, um, just off the top of my head, you know, just if you're asking about the Lincoln aviator, uh, that is another vehicle. Unfortunately, I have not reviewed. I would love to review one. Um, I've been asking Lincoln for cars for years and I'm not sure what the deal is with Lincoln. I used to get Lincoln's all the time. I had like the MKX. Um, I did do the navigator and, uh, I think I did one or two others, but, uh, yeah, I'm not sure Lincoln just like, I know they have Lincoln's in the press fleet and for some reason I just don't get them even though I ask for them. Uh, so I'm not sure what's going on with Lincoln. I know they weren't happy uh, several years ago whenever I talked about how the MKX was on the same platform as the Ford Edge, but I said the Lincoln was the nicer one and I would pay the extra money for the Lincoln, even though it is on the Edge platform, but they didn't even like that I even mentioned the word Ford in my Lincoln review. <laughs> so I don't know if that's part of why maybe I'm blacklisted with Lincoln, but then Ford sends me stuff. So it's not like Ford everywhere, but again, I guess they're separate from Lincoln. So um, I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's the case or not. Um, I have tried to ask and ask again and it's never gone anywhere. So I just kind of have given up on Lincoln at this point, but I might try and see if I can add some more Lincolns again this year. But um, I know a lot of you, you know, you don't, you're not super into SUVs. 
So that's another reason why I haven't been super desperate to try and get into some uh, Lincolns because that's all they're doing these days. So, um, you know, not a huge deal, but they do make some, I think they make some beautiful cars. They have some of the best looking SUVs out there right now. Some of the best looking interiors as well. I think Lincoln's firing on all cylinders. I have nothing against them. I think they're fantastic. And I think the Aviator, um, again, I have not driven it, so I can't say, but from the outside and the inside and from what I've heard, I think the Aviator is probably one of the most competitive vehicles in that segment as far as you know luxury three row stuff that's another one for um the person who was asking earlier about luxury three row if you're okay going with american stuff the aviator i think would be a great choice you can get that with the plug-in hybrid thing have like 600 and some pound feet of torque in that aviator uh, grand touring model i think that would be a rocket of you know a three row you know luxury crossover with that much torque would be amazing so um, I think it'd be sweet. Um, I would love to, uh, you know, review that. And I think the aviator is worth checking out. I just can't tell you whether or not it drives any good because I have no clue. Uh, I was not a fan of the Explorer ST though, um, which it does share a platform with, even though Lincoln doesn't want you to know that. Um, you know, so that's, you know, that would be my only holdup is I'd be worried it would feel a little bit too much like the Explorer because I didn't love the way the Explorer drove, but I know the Lincoln at least has a much nicer interior than that Explorer did. So that'd be a huge improvement for sure. Um, all right. And, uh, yeah, I don't know if Lincoln is upset about that or not. I see Aziz's comment here. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I have no clue what's going on, but I will continue to try with Lincoln. Um, we have a Guevara's, I probably butchered your pr pronunciation. I'm terribly sorry, but he says Toyota just trademarked the Grand Highlander nameplate. What are your thoughts? Well, you are the first person to tell me that I did not see that. Um, so like a forerunner replacement, so the forerunner can focus on more off-road or just some legroom. I think if they are actually doing a Grand Highlander, which would not fit with their, their naming structure, I don't think they've ever done a Grand anything. It's very Jeep sounding. Um, but uh, Grand Highlander, I would assume, would just be a longer Highlander. And it's not like the Highlander's, you know, too small, but, you know, considering how you have, you know, much larger vehicles that are getting more and more popular. Um, and you have stuff like the Telluride, which is a tiny bit bigger, which, you know, has a little bit more room. Maybe they're going to try and stretch it out. I have no clue, but that is, that is a curveball. I did not hear that rumor. Um, I don't think it would be a four runner replacement. I mean, I get, you know, kind of what you're thinking with like the Grand Cherokee thing um, potentially, but honestly, I think that they have such brand equity in Forerunner and Land Cruiser that, I think they would go with those before they go with Grand Highlander. I could be wrong, um, but that's very interesting. I'll have to kick that around some more and see if I can find more info on that as well. Um, and the VAC dude points out the Land Cruiser is gone. That is correct, but it sounds like the Land Cruiser will be returning um, based on what dealers have been saying. So uh, we'll have to wait and see on all that. But um, yeah, and then we have um, Gustavo says, hey, Matt, C8 or C7? Um, that is another personal preference thing because they're completely different driving vehicles. I mean, aside from having, you know, basically the same engine, it's, it couldn't be more different of a driving experience. Obviously, you know, you have one that's, you know, much more tail happy. I mean, trying to break a C8 loose, I mean, you have to be pretty brave. I think it's going to be easier, obviously, with the faster versions coming, but a stock C8, you know, it does not want to really drift around too much. I mean, it'll do a little bit. I got, I kind of provoked it a little bit in my week of driving to get it to kick out a little bit on dry roads. But, uh, you know, I think if the C7 just kind of feels more like a muscly car, it doesn't feel like it's a challenger or anything, but I think the C7, you know, it just was wheel spin galore. I mean, it just, I mean, the C8 would just leave a C7 for dead, obviously, because you just have such better power to the ground. So if you like wheel spin, C7. If you don't like wheel spin or if you just want to go as fast as possible, C8. And that's probably going to be the biggest differentiator aside from the balance thing of you know, having a big heavy engine up front or having a, the engine you know right behind you in a nice central position. Um, you know, it's all comes down to personal preference. Of course, the looks are wildly different as well. Um, and the pricing these days is wildly different too, because, you know, you can get a bargain of, for a C7. I think a used C7 is one of the best sports car values you can get right now, because, you know, you can get one, I'm pretty sure they're, you know, right around 30 grand or so. It's not expensive for a fantastic car with a really good manual, with a fantastic sounding V8, still great looks, um, great handling, um, especially the Grand Sport version, I think is really spectacular if you want to dial back some of that wheel spin. Um, but yeah, um, I, I don't know which one I would pick personally, but I think you can't go wrong with either one. Uh, it just comes down to, again, what those personal preferences are. But as far as 
um, you know, which one's the, the better one to live with. I think that, uh, I think it's still easier to live with a C7 too, because you have, you know, the big hatch and stuff, even though you have multiple trunks in the C8, it's just not as practical as having a huge hatch like you have in the C7. So there's a lot of stuff at play there, but I can't go wrong with either one, but, uh, yeah, it's just great. We have so many good choices. So Matt is asking most reliable SUV slash crossover for around fifteen thousand um, dollars. Well, you can't go wrong with you know something like a Honda CRV or a Toyota Rav4. That's probably going to be the most reliable, especially the Rav4, even a little bit more so. But I think you know that's probably going to be your top two bets. Um, everything else is probably just going to fall a little bit short of those two. That's why everyone loves Toyotas. They just they're still rock solid with their reliability, and that's why people love them. All right, other questions here. Um, yeah, a lot of people are saying they go for the C7 just for the manual. That is another huge differentiator. If you're, you know, wanting a stick, obviously you only have one choice there, and uh, it's it's still I. It's kind of a bummer they didn't put the manual in the C8 because that would have been really awesome. Since no one else is really offering a mid-engine manual car anymore, that would have been cool. But it is what it is. Um, <clears throat> so the back dude says, "Hey Matt, getting permits soon. What is a good cheap used car to get started with?" Um, Okay, so some of my favorite picks, my honestly, my go-to pick for a new driver that's fun. If you're willing to learn manual, I would say Honda Civic Si. Any generation, doesn't matter. They're all fantastic. Um, but especially, you know, any of the VTEC ones, I think are just awesome and you can't go wrong with them. They're just, they're nice and comfortable. They make really good daily drivers. So you can still take them everywhere. They're reliable. They're a ton of fun. They sound great. They have a huge aftermarket uh, support uh, and community. They're just really fun. I love driving them. And, uh, yeah, it's just a really, really good car. So I think that's kind of one of my favorite picks. And the thing is like, they're so reliable that you can buy one with, you know, well over a hundred thousand miles on it and you don't have to be terrified of it blowing up on you. And you know, it's, it can still run for a long while. I mean, there's been some, uh, civic SIs from like the, what is it? I think Oh five Oh six, uh, generation, you know, those, um, mid to late two thousands. I mean, I've seen some of those like 250,000 miles still running well. Um, so I mean, there, there's some solid, uh, little vehicles. And so I, I think that's one of my favorite picks. Uh, but there's lots of good stuff. It, you know, doesn't matter, you know, it kind of just comes down to what you're looking for. You know I mean? You could go for like a Miata or something. Those are a fun little first car. Um, it just, you know, it comes down to how much practicality you need, how much, um, you know, you're willing to, you know, do you want a manual? Do you want an automatic? Do you need all wheel drive? Do you want, you know, I would recommend front wheel drive though for a new driver. I think that makes it easiest to learn. Um, cause rear wheel drive, if you don't know what you're doing, you can kind of get yourself, um, in trouble a little bit easier than you can with front wheel drive. So I'd probably stick with something front wheel drive, but if you're a little adventurous, you know, something like a Miata or something is always a fun pick. Um, all right. So we have a uh, bunch of different questions here. Um, Connor says name, uh, maybe this is, all right. Maybe I think that's talking to somebody else. I'm not sure. Um, goth rocker says, what about the uh, Honda Ridgeline 2021? Any news on availability? Will you do a review? Um, I would like to do a review on one, um, but I'm not sure when they're going to be starting to arrive. I thought, I thought whenever I did the weekly update covering it, they said that it was going to be on sale like the next week. Um, so maybe there's a delay there. I'm not sure if they're not already at dealers, they should be at dealers. I don't know why they're not there yet. Um, so maybe there's something, some kind of, uh, issue that I'm not, I don't, don't know about. I don't know, but, um, yeah, I'd like to review one. I think they've made a huge improvement with the looks on them with the, you know, new styling and something looks great. So, uh, I'd be up for doing another one cause I really enjoyed my week with the Ridgeline and, uh, my buddy actually just bought a Ridgeline this past year. He loves it. Um, and uh, it was a really great truck for him. You know, he just kind of, you know, decided he didn't need, you know, something body on frame. The Ridgeline suited all of his needs and, uh, you know, that was it. So, I think the Ridgeline is a great truck. Um, Kevin, thank you so much for the super chat. He says, he says uh, what percentage of monthly income do you think is reasonable to spend on car payments? Um, it depends how car crazy you are. I mean, you know, it's, that's a very 
personal thing. So I think that's kind of a hard thing to say, you know, one size fits all like this amount of your money. I mean, obviously you have the, you know, financial advisors. I went to school for financial planning. So, you know, there's the percentages of you should have this much for your housing payment, this much for your car payment and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it totally comes down to, you know, what do you do? Do you eat ramen noodles every day and, you know, you know, want to have a really sweet car or do you, you know, not care as much about your car. I, it really just comes down to all that kind of stuff. You know, what type of house you're living in. I mean, there's some people that have, you know, houses with vinyl siding and then they have a Lamborghini in the garage and that's just their personal preference. Um, you know, there's even some, some YouTubers that, you know, have these little houses and they got, you know, their cars are worth more than their houses. That's fine. You know, it's different things for different people. I don't, I don't judge. You know, everyone has something that works for them. Um, so I think it's hard to say, what's reasonable because i think that totally comes down to you know subjectivity um and so yeah i mean it's that's always i mean for a long time like for me it was a huge chunk of my earnings were car payments uh especially back in college and stuff it was basically like i worked like a dog all summer in every break i had you know working 60 hours a week or more um, so that I could afford my car and I had basically no social life. So if you want to have a social life, you should probably spend less on a car. Uh, if you want to be like me and uh, just, you know, have a really sweet car and not much else, <laughs> then, uh, you know, you can do that as well. And it just depends on what works for you. So um, I can't give a real solid answer. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it's just obviously you don't want to stress yourself out. You don't want to um, stretch yourself too far. I think that, you know, some of these people are doing these super long loans, um, on stuff and stretching themselves a little bit too thin. And I think that that's something that's easy to fall into because cars have gotten so expensive these days. And so, you know, and people don't want a bare bones model. You want to have your nice, you know, features and stuff. So I, I don't judge anyone for even doing a long loan, but I think, you know, one thing that I've seen, especially in the exotic car world, which is a little bit easier to be critical of, because then you're talking about really being a little far reaching is, you know, some of these people that, you know, finance their exotic cars for 144 months with sketchy loan terms and stuff like that. And then they end up having to do fire sales and, you know, they get repoed and everything else. I mean, there, that happens way more often than you realize because I, you know, I'm friends with uh, lots of people in uh, the exotic car community in Pittsburgh and stuff. And, um, you know, some of the stories I've heard from car dealers and stuff, it is, it's just really hilarious how some of these people stretch themselves too thin. So I think that's the only thing is, you know, live within your means, you know, you don't have to, you know, pay cash for everything. I don't think in my opinion, but you know, I think that obviously you shouldn't be taking out loans on exotic cars if you're not really well off, you know, but that's really the only advice I think I can give there. Uh, Steven Rapp, thank you so much for another super chat. He says, do you think the bullet will go up uh, or hold value in 10 years? Um, based on history with the past two generations of the bullet, it seems like uh, they don't, they don't go up in value. They don't really hold their value, but they they hold a higher threshold. They kind of bottom out at a higher point than normal Mustangs do. So if you look at like the 2008 Bullet Mustangs, for example, even one with high miles on it, I mean, generally they get driven less than a regular Mustang does. So they're at, on average, they have lower miles. Um, but I think, you know, for, uh, you know, most of them, you know, you end up seeing that they are averaging from last I saw, you know, maybe like an 08 bullet is like worth maybe five grand more than a regular 08 Mustang GT. So, you know, I'm expecting, you know, in 10 years that the bullet will be worth maybe a few grand more than, you know, a comparable 2019 Mustang GT is worth in 10 years. So I, I fully expect it to depreciate and I don't care if it goes to zero. I mean, for me, it's a car I never plan on selling. I don't care what the resale value is. I, I, yeah, I could not care less at all about that. It'd be nice if it turned into some nice investment or something. And I think it is kind of a high watermark in, you know, car history because, you know, with Mustang, you know, going with this electric thing with the Mach-E and stuff, who knows what the next generation Mustang is going to do. Is it going to have a manual with a naturally aspirated V8? I don't know. And so this could kind of be one of those high points uh, in history, and maybe that could help it to, you know, stay higher. Uh, we'll have to wait and see, but I plan on keeping it my whole life. I plan to hopefully pass it down to uh, my kids someday, and, uh, you know, hopefully they can enjoy it if we live in a world where they can still enjoy a you know, gasoline-powered vehicle and stuff. We'll have to wait and see, but, um, yeah, I don't know. But uh, thank you so much again for the super chat. Um R. Williams says, thoughts on daily driving 2020 GT500. Um, if you can do it, I would 100% go for it. I would just strongly recommend going for the uh, 
non-track pack version. That would be uncomfortable to daily drive, I think. I mean, I know everyone has different preferences. So if you like, you know, daily driving a vehicle that feels like a race car, go for it. But uh, personally, I would much rather have a regular GT500 um, with the regular seats and all that kind of stuff would be uh, be the better way to, get to do that. But uh, it's been a really fun car. I mean, I did basically daily drive the GT500 I had um, for this past uh, you know year. It was a lot of fun and uh, they're sweet. But um, yeah, if you have one, R. Williams, congrats. They're awesome. Uh, Nippon says, would you pay extra for the uh, Camry XSE over the Camry SE? It looks like it's three to th three to $4,000 more than the SE. I'd have to look at the uh, the breakdown of features again to remind myself. Um, but basically, I mean, it just comes out of how much of those luxury features you want. If they're worth, you know, three to $4,000 to you, um, then go for it. If you really do want those features and you're not wanting to stretch that much, you know, you could kind of go to a used one or go to a higher mileage used one if you are looking at used uh, versions already. But, um, you know, I think that also is another thing that comes down to personal preference. I personally like having pretty loaded up vehicles. Um, so I would be one of those people that would stretch for the extra toys and the extra luxuries. Um, but I think that's just because that's kind of what I've always had. Like even you know, my first car, I was planning on buying a WRX and I was like, I don't care. I remember even at one point saying that I don't even care about cruise control. Like if I have a car with cruise control, I'm just going to rip it out. I don't even, I don't want any luxuries at all. Like that was like 16 year old me talking. And then, uh, you know, because I worked at a dealership and uh, they get trade-ins, you know, I had an opportunity to buy the legacy GT spec B that I bought. And it was the same price as a used WRX that I was planning on getting. And I had all the luxury features I didn't have in the, in the uh, WRX. And, uh, and that kind of, I guess, turned me on to the luxury vehicles a little bit. And I was like, you know what? It's kind of nice to have a leather interior and heated seats and, uh, you know, a six disc CD changer, which was like the nice thing <laughs> on a 2006 model vehicle. Um, you know, that kind of stuff was nice. And so, yeah, I think that's kind of what got me to appreciate the luxury stuff a little bit more. Jonathan, this is an interesting question. He said, do manufacturers ever tell you anything you can't say to avoid being removed from their press fleet lineup? No. Um, so I guess I'm trying to think of like how to even frame this. So manufacturers never tell us anything we're not supposed to say. There'll be sometimes where if I'm on like a press trip or something, they'll be like, you know, here's the things that we're really excited about on this vehicle. Um, and they'll want to make sure that we, you know, don't have any wrong information or anything. So, um, you know, there's those types of things, but there's never been a time, I don't think, where they've said there's anything that I can't say. And they definitely would not threaten you with uh, removing you from the from like being blacklisted or anything like that. I think the only time, the only time people actually that I know of get blacklisted for stuff is if you're being really stupid and you wreck a car. But I've even, I've actually, um, you know, known of people wrecking vehicles on press drives or press trips. And even if they did something a little bit silly, if it, if it's not a pattern, then they usually won't just immediately write you off anyway. But I mean, that's, I mean, even like I said, there's been people that have wrecked vehicles and they still get press vehicles and car companies don't hate them. Um, so, so as far as what to say, yeah, they've never said that. And there's nothing they've ever told me not to say. And um, really, you know, this is something that a lot of people, you know, have a misconception that, oh, I can't like be critical in my reviews because then they'll just like take the cars away from me. And that's not the case at all. Um, honestly, manufacturers are super cool with criticism as long as it's fair. You know, if I state things how they are, like, for example, in my Toyota Venza video that's going to be coming out tomorrow on the interior review on that, it has less interior space than a RAV4. I'm going to say, like, this has less interior space than a RAV4. Like, if you are buying your SUV for practicality, why would you spend the extra on the Venza when you can get a RAV4? And that's fair criticism. Like Toyota knows that the Venza has less space than the, uh, you know, the, than the uh, RAV4. So, you know, they can't be mad when I point that out. I'm just pointing out facts. Now the subjective stuff, you know, if you're being really obnoxious, um, you know, there, there are sometimes, you know, I've, I've heard some stories from manufacturers where, you know, there's been people that have deliberately misled stuff and made things seem worse than they really were just to play it up for the video um, and, you know, or that there's been something that just they misrepresented. And if you're actually being um, deceptive or, 
you know, misrepresenting things or you're just being unfair and you're just like, this is terrible. This has no purpose, but it has a purpose or, you know, the, you know, just those types of things. If you're just being ignorant, that that's how you get on their bad side. But, you know, all of my criticisms, I, and if you've watched my reviews, especially this past year, I do not hold back. I mean, the Toyota Land Cruiser, I was like, this thing's 90 grand and a Toyota Corolla has a nicer interior. I flat out said that Toyota has never said a word to me about it. There's no issues because they have eyes. They can see that the Land Cruiser interior isn't as nice as a Corolla. And that's why the rumors about the new Land Cruiser are that it's going to have a more luxurious interior for the next one coming out in a year or two. It's going to be more up to its price tag. Toyota knows this stuff. You know, I'm not revealing anything to them. They don't know. So, I mean, you know, they're not going to be upset about that. I know plenty of Land Cruiser fans were super mad at me. Like, oh, Toyota loves, you know, selling, you know, five Land Cruisers a year and they're totally fine with it. It's like, no, like, I'm not crazy. Like, trust me. And now, you know, I've been vindicated because there's rumors that Toyota is going to make the new Land Cruiser more luxurious. So, you know, but even with that stuff, you know, I can be brutal on the Land Cruiser and, you know, Toyota does not care because they know that it's fair. And as long as it's fair, no one ever complains. Um, so like I said, the only time I actually ever had a manufacturer ever call me out on something was like I said, Lincoln. Um, they didn't like that. I mentioned that the edge um, is related to the MKX. <laughs> That's the only thing, which is really, a silly thing, but, um, yeah. Yeah. And Jason says TFL got blacklisted by Ford. Yeah. TFL, they, um, it's really a shame. I love those guys. They're so awesome. Um, and, uh, yeah, the amount of, you know, they do really good testing and it's so silly that some of these car companies blacklist them because they are stand up guys. They're totally hundred percent honest, but they just call it how they see it as well. And sometimes there are some companies, Ford is one of them that. Um, you know, they, they, you know, sometimes are a little bit more, um, less receptive to the criticism than some of the others. Now Ford has been nice to me. They gave me priority ordering with the bullet. You know, I have VIN number, you know, 13 for the bullet or whatever, um, which they wanted me to keep a secret for some reason, but I, I didn't think that was important. Um, but you know, so they, you know, there's that kind of stuff, but, um, you know, so they've always been treating me well, but it's kind of, yeah, Ford is one of those ones um, that you can, I guess, get on their blacklist pretty easily, I guess. Thankfully, I have not, but um, I'm always going to be honest in my reviews with you guys. That is something that I've always, always, you know, been wanting to do. And a lot of people, you know, they don't believe it. They think, oh, well, he's being too nice or he never is critical enough. And then whenever I am critical, they're like, oh, well, he's biased or something. So like, I can't win either way, but just know 100% of the time, I'm always honest for better or for worse. I tell it how it is. And, you know, that's just, that's just, that's just the way it is with me. There's no, uh, no spin here on my channel, but, um, Dom, thank you so much for the super chat. I really appreciate it. And if you have any more questions, please feel free to ask them. I'll try and find them here. Um, we have, uh, my sister-in-law Caroline is here. Thanks for joining Carrie. I appreciate it. Um, hopefully this isn't boring too much. She actually, though, speaking of Toyota RAV4s, she just bought one of those this past year as well and loves it. Um, so, uh, yeah, lots of, uh, Toyota love here, even though I am critical of their interior sometimes. Kyle, thank you so much for the generous super chat. He says, Hey Matt, two things. First, why did TFL get blacklisted? LOL. And second, do you think the new Chevrolet bolts coming in the summer will be all wheel drive? Um, the TFL thing is not my story to tell. I, I'm, I've talked to them a bunch. I actually hung out with them on the uh, Hellcat uh, launch here for the uh, the Red Eye Charger and the Hellcat Durango. Got to hang out with them, um, you know, a few months back, and that was awesome to get reunited with them because, um, you know, we hadn't hung out and you know, obviously since before COVID. Um, but that is not my story to tell. So if they have not uh, revealed all that stuff, then I will. Um, keep my lips sealed on that one out of respect for them. Unfortunately, I would love to answer your question, but, uh, I cannot, uh, second though, he says, uh, yeah, the bolt being all wheel drive. Um, I think that that would certainly be something they're going to have to do considering it's going to be a crossover for the, you know, higher version of the bolt, whatever they end up calling it. But, um, I think, you know, for it to be a real SUV, they're going to have to do all wheel drive. Um, and so I think that they will probably have all wheel drive on that, at least as an option. It'd probably be front wheel drive as standard, but I'm sure you'll be able to get an all wheel drive version. Um, it would make a lot of sense, I think. Um, all right. So other questions here we have, um, moon says Toyota and Lexus are not going away. That uh, question is overly too hype for KDMs. Um, and then we have Jonathan says ready for the next hundred thousand uh, acceleration compilation. Yeah, you and me both. Uh, the channel has grown this year, and I'm thankful for the growth, but it is 
definitely a snail's pace <laughs> compared to what it used to be. That's okay. I'm just happy to continue doing this. Um, but yeah, it'll be a while until I hit 500,000 subscribers, I think. So unfortunately, uh, the acceleration compilation will have to wait. I've kept it going this long. I can't break the tradition. Um, so hopefully we can get to 500K at some point and uh, do that next one. But um, yeah, in the meantime, just more time to uh, pile up more uh, more reactions for the next compilation. Um Connor says, hey, Matt, longtime subscriber. My dream car is the Ford Focus RS. Do you feel these cars will be great values in about five years? Um, I think so. Um, you know, they're, I think that's, the, especially since they are not bringing the new version here or any version of the Focus for that matter. I mean, the fact we only got it for that one generation, it was such a good car. Um, I think it would definitely be, um, a good investment down the road. I could definitely see that being one of the cars in, you know, 20, 25 years, 30 years, that'll probably be worth big money, especially since they didn't make a ton of them either. And like I said, they're pretty rare. My only thing with the Focus RS is the seating position was just kind of weird. I was never totally comfortable in the RS, both the one I, I reviewed and then the one that I had for a week, both of them. I just wish the seating position was a little more comfortable. That's the only thing as a daily driver I didn't love, but uh, I know someone that has a Focus RS though. They really love it. And, um, you know, they've, yeah. So I think it just also comes down to your body type and stuff. It just probably didn't fit very well with my body type or something. But uh, yeah, they're they're great vehicles. Um, so definitely a good one to invest in. Um, all right. So we have, uh, Connor says, would you recommend a Fiesta ST or Focus ST for a first car uh, that was in a Northern state? Um between those two, uh, I don't know which one I would pick. I mean, obviously, it just comes down to which one has more power. But if you're asking about either one, I think that they would be fine for, you know, as long as you put snow tires on it, you'll be okay. I think a lot of people, you know, I know they want the security of all-wheel drive. And if you're really driving in super deep snow all the time, then yes, go for all-wheel drive and get a WRX or something like that. But I think most people most, most people could get around just fine with front wheel drive and snow tires, at least here in the States. If you're up in Canada or something, definitely could see all wheel drive, you know, being something you're going to need. But, um, yeah, I think, yeah, you should be totally fine. I can't remember. This is terrible. I don't remember. I'm pretty sure both of those have limited slip differentials in the front. Right. Um, cause that would certainly help in the winter months. Um, if they don't, then that'd be something that's like a concern, for example, with like, uh, the Veloster turbo, cause that does not have, a limited slip diff. And so that could get a little bit dicier in the snow than something like a Civic SI, for example, which has a limited slip diff, um, you know, can help you out a little bit better with traction there. But um, I love the Fiesta ST and Focus ST, both fantastic vehicles and uh, definitely would recommend both of those. Dom, thank you so much for another super chat. He says, do you think the NSX R8 um, and uh, GTR are in the same category considering uh, they're relatively close in price? Um, Kind of, you know, I think it's, especially with the NSX and the GTR, I can see those kind of being in the same category um, just because they're both, you know, this high-tech GDM thing with the all-wheel drive and you have, you know, the twin turbo V6s and stuff. Those are a little bit more comparable um, than the r 8 I think that is um, kind of in its own thing because that is a little bit more old school exotic, you know, with having just the naturally aspirated engine and all kind of stuff. Um, but I think there are kind of kind of in the same category. The GTR is really the outlier here, right? Cause it's the only one that's not mid engine and stuff. Um, but I think the GTR, the GTR takes a very special buyer cause it's definitely going to be less exotic than all the others. Um, so it's just someone who really loves skylines and GTRs and stuff like that. That's going to go for those. Um, even though they are fantastic cars, uh, it's just, you know, there's a lot of other stuff that's popped up. That's, you know, pretty competitive and very awesome. Like, I mean, you know, you can get like a Audi RS five for, you know, way less that has massaging seats, luxurious, comfortable, pretty close to being as fast in a straight line and stuff for way less, you know? So I think that's kind of where the GTR struggles, but the GTR is still so special. And if I actually did like live in Canada and I needed an all wheel drive car to drive all year round and had lots of snow to deal with and stuff, a GTR would still be pretty high up on my list of dream daily drivers, even with its pretty subpar interior and stuff. It would just, I, I don't know. Maybe I think it's just, you know, the JDM lover in me and, you know, the fast and furious connection and stuff. A GTR is still a car I would love to have someday. Um, I don't, I couldn't justify it. Like I said, unless I needed an all wheel drive coupe with a back seat. 
Um, you know, but it's there is they're so so sweet. If I ever do end up needing an all-wheel drive coupe, uh GTR would still be very high on my list. I love those things. Um, and thank you again for the super chat. Goth Rocker7, thank you so much for a super chat here as well. He says, Thanks for answering earlier about the new Ridgeline. Hope you review it. Hope, uh, or how come no review on your channel on the Lincoln Continental? I know it is gone, but uh, you did a few Cadillac CT6 reviews. Want to get one of those used? Um, I that's another vehicle. I begged Lincoln for a Continental to review for years, and I kept asking my fleet office. And so, part of it maybe wasn't so. So the way the press cars work is they are sent by the manufacturers through a press fleet office. Um, so the office, you know, they get a bunch of new cars and they hold them and they, you know, loan them out to people and stuff. They only can work with what Lincoln sends them, for example. Um, so it's kind of, they have their hands tied. So I kept asking the, the fleet office, like, you know, I'd love to review Continental, I'd love to review one. Um, and they were just like, we don't have any in the press fleet. So I think like after the very first year that the Continental was on the market, Lincoln was like done marketing it. Uh, at least in my region, I get my press cars from the Washington DC area. There was no Continental in the fleet or they just don't, Lincoln doesn't like me. And they just said they didn't have one in the fleet. I have no clue, but um, regardless, I tried very hard to get a Continental for years. Uh, I did do a quick drive video on one if you saw that, um, cause there was one at a drive event that I did, um, with a bunch of different cars. And so I did have a quick drive video and got to sample it for, you know, 10 minutes or so. And that was it. Um, but they do, they are a really good value now too, because you know, they're getting pretty cheap on the used market now. And it's such a nice, luxurious, comfortable car from the you know quick little test drive I did. Um, I really liked it a lot. Uh, I would love to review one and I'm still open to, you know, if someone offers me one um, somewhere, you know, kind of close to me here, I would love to review one still, uh, even though I'm sure many people on the channel probably wouldn't love it because it's not, you know, fast and, um, you know, import or uh, muscle or anything like that. But uh, I'd still love to review one for my own personal curiosity because I, I think they're really cool and a really good looking vehicle as well. Uh, but thank you so much again for the super chat and good luck finding one if you do decide to buy one. Hopefully you can find one that's just uh, how you like it. Um, they're really pretty, I, especially if you can get the ones with the upgraded uh, headlights or the jewel eye headlights or whatever they call it. Um, they're really, really cool cars. Um, Tori says, hi, uh, big fan, Matt. Uh, what are your top three stock sound systems in new vehicles and why? Very good question. I've actually been thinking about doing a video of rounding up like stereos um, potentially this sometime this winter. But I'd say as far as reasonably priced stuff, the stuff that I've been most impressed with actually has mostly been the Bose systems. I think the Bose systems and the newest Mazda, so the Mazda 3 and the Mazda CX-30, is one of my favorite systems. I love, love, love that system. Every time I'm in a Mazda 3 or a CX-30, like all I want to do is listen to the radio the whole time, or not the radio, my actual like wired-in source. Because that system, not only is it really ingenious with its speaker placement, because you have speakers not in the doors, but in the footwell instead. And so there's no vibration from the doors. Um, it's such a cleaner base with that and stuff. It is so good. But also those new Mazdas uh, actually um, can play uh, the lossless FLAC files. So, I mean, you're talking about like the best source possible and you're getting it through a brilliantly designed Bose stereo and you're getting it all for vehicles that cost, you know, 25, 30, $35,000 tops. Like it is really, I mean, a fantastic stereo. I wish Mazda would market it more because it truly, I think is my favorite stereo in that segment. Um, going up the ladder a little bit, I think that some of the Cadillac systems in their um, Bose vehicles and also the Bose system in the C8 Corvette actually really impressive um, on their top, you know, uh, Bose uh, performance series system or whatever they call it. That is definitely, I think the, uh, you know, one of the best as far as sports cars goes. Um, and then uh, another one I love is the Acura systems. That ELS Studio 3D system is fantastic. I was blown away by it in the RDX. It sounded so, so good. Um, and then in the TLX I just had this year, it was fantastic again. And I was like, man, I love this stereo. And that was another car where all I wanted to do is listen to my entire iPod all week and all my music. And just that was all I wanted to do. I mean, it drove fantastic, but I just, that comfort, that comfortable ride in that TLX and then that stereo, like, oh, it was great. Also, the Cadillac CT6 is another one with that Bose Panoray system with 36 speakers. Man, that thing knocked my socks off as well. It was... <laughs> It was impressive. So I think those are some of my top ones that stand out to me as being really, really good. There's lots of others that are, you know, pretty good as well. But 
I think those are the ones that are the standout, like easy answer, like hands down some of the best systems. And I don't do too many super high end vehicles, so I can't weigh in on some of the super fancy systems in some of the other vehicles out there, um, you know, cause I don't get really too many Mercedes press vehicles or BMWs or anything like that. So don't have a ton of experience with those. One other one though, the Bowers and Wilkins stereo and the Volvos is another one that like, is like, you know, whatever I'm doing, I'm just listening to my music in that thing. Cause it just sounded so, so good. And there's Volvos with that system as well. Dom, thank you so much for another super chat. He says, what do you think is the best thing about the NSX R8, i8, and GTR, interior, exterior, and driving experience. Um, so the best thing about the NSX, I think, is its handling. The way that it grips out of corners and the way it can claw with those front wheels to really pull you through. And it just, it's a very cool one. You're sitting so low in the NSX, too. It's really, really cool. The R8, the best thing about it. Um, is definitely going to be the driving experience as well. That V10, especially in the V10 versions, it sounds so, so good. Um, that's definitely the standout feature in that. Um, and then as far as the i8, that's very cool. I think the i8's best trait, though, is its exterior. It just looks so, so cool. Um, it, it drove well, too. I enjoyed the i8 that I reviewed. Um, it was just, you know, for that price and, you know, just what how it looked, I think a lot of people were just hoping for more. And we never really got more out of the i8, but I think it's a really great car, especially if you want a cool daily driver to just, you know, kind of just look like a boss in and and have, you know, something pretty luxurious as well. Um, and then have something that just gets such good fuel economy too. I think the i8 is a really great choice, uh, especially for a daily driven supercar. And then uh, GTR, that is all about the driving experience, of course. Um, I mean, I think the exterior looks great too, but I think... Um, with the GTR, it's all about how how fast it is. Because the interior, even though they've improved in the past couple of years here, it still is going to be you know far cry from anything else in that price range. And so that's uh, kind of where those all fall. So hopefully that answers your question. Thank you so much for the another super chat here, Gabriel Young. Thank you so much for a super chat as well. It says message retracted. So I'm sorry if you retracted it, if there's an issue there, but I will definitely keep an eye out for your question and try and answer it if I see it pop up here. Um, thank you so much again for the super chat. Um, Langston uh, says, do you only read super chats because we have a lot of questions here too? No, I, I try and get to as many as I can. It's just, I have to give priority to those people that are doing the super chats. I feel like that's only fair, but I definitely want to answer as many as I can. Just been getting lots of super chats tonight. Um, but I'm going to try and stick around here for, you know, another hour or so and uh, answer as many regular questions as I can too. Um, Doug says, hi, Matt. Do you think GM will debut the C8 Z06 this year? We covered this a little bit earlier in the uh, live stream, uh, but I'm hoping they do. It sounds like it's something that might be delayed a little bit, uh, but from everything that I've seen so far, I think everyone's still expecting it at some point this year, whether that's the end of this year or summer, I don't know, but um, I think it's going to probably be a little bit of a, a wait still just because COVID has pushed everything back. Um, and uh, so Marco says, GTR 50th anniversary, good collector car. Um, could potentially be, uh, you know, the GTR has just been around for a while and they've built a good amount of them. Uh, but GTRs have been holding their value really well. I mean, you know, the first few years of them, they kind of you know, dropped a little bit quicker, but you know, once they kept raising the prices, I feel like they are starting to hold their value a little bit better. And especially now that there isn't really anything new coming. Um, I think that, you know, although they're doing incremental upgrades every year, I feel like, you know, they seem to be holding their value pretty well. I don't know about the anniversary edition, if that's going to hold any better. I think honestly, if you want a good collector GTR, you're better off getting a Nismo. Um, but that's just... Um, my thoughts, I think that, you know, it's kind of this whole thing, you know, same thing, you know, someone asked earlier about the bullet being a collector vehicle. I think with that, you're better off buying a Shelby. Shelby's always hold their value better. They're going to go for more money in 50 years at Bear Jackson than a bullet will. Um, and so getting that extra badge, I think is better than a special edition, unless it's super rare or something really crazy. Um, you know, I think that the Shelby's and the Nismo's and stuff are going to be the ones that are going to be more desirable down the road. If you're talking about collector vehicles. Um, Jonathan says, Hey Matt, uh, do you think it's fine getting the current gen STI or WX or do you think it's worth the wait for the next gen ones? Um, that comes down to what you're going for, especially with the STI with that engine being super old and stuff. You know, if you're fine getting 15 miles a gallon out of a four cylinder, then go for the regular STI. Um, the current one, I think that's fine. Um, 
But uh, yeah, I, I mean, the current WX is, you know, still fairly modern. You get good fuel economy, good interior, all that kind of stuff. Um, it just really comes down to what you're looking for. If you want the old school STI feeling, this current gen is going to be the last way to get that. Um, with that box of rumble and stuff, that's all going to probably go away here with the new STI. So you're wanting one of those for that, uh, but then you're mentioning the WRX. So I'm guessing you're not super worried about the box of rumble and stuff. Um, but if you are, you know, this is really the last, you know, last year to get one of those new STIs. Um, the WRX, I mean, they've been out for a while now. Um, I'm, I personally am not super impressed with them anymore, considering all the new, more exciting competition out there that's really been, you know, impressing me the past few years. But, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with the current WRX. I think it's still really good value to get all the car you get, all the horsepower you get for that money with all wheel drive and stuff, a good, you know, spacious vehicle and everything. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with the WRX. It just, to me, doesn't handle as well as I wish it did, but I have not driven the performance pack version. I've heard that's better. Um, but without the performance pack, I'd say handling is the only thing that that and the rev hang, the rev hang in the manual WRX is, is still atrocious to me. I just, I don't know why companies do such terrible rev hang. And it's not just them. Honda's guilty of it as well with the SI and stuff. Um, but that's the only other thing there. I don't know if the rev hangs going to get any better though in the new version. So I wouldn't hold my breath for that. But um, the SCI, I think that's really a special car as long as you're okay with the terrible fuel economy. <laughs> I think that'd be, uh, you know, one worth getting and not waiting for. Uh, so Steven, thank you so much for another super chat. He says, have bullet GT500 and getting C8 delivery in a week. What car should I get to add to this collection? No supercars. Thanks again for doing this. Well, you already have an awesome collection. Congrats on that. Um, what to add? Honestly, so I, although I love the current C8, I think that the Z06 is going to be pure magical gold whenever it comes out because you're going to have a flat plane crank, you know, screamer of an engine it sounds like it's gonna have super high red line be like absolutely bonkers you have already the great base of the regular c8 um and then you know it just i feel like that new z06 is really going to be legendary think of like all the good things about the gt350 um in a mid-engine platform you know with uh, the c8's looks and stuff really good handling I know you might maybe want to upgrade your C8. Maybe you can just trade your current C8 in for the Z06, so that wouldn't really replace anything. Um, but I think a Z06 is definitely worth putting on order. If you like the current C8 and you have the money, hands down, get in line for the Z06, because that sounds like it's going to be fantastic if they actually deliver on all the rumors. Um, aside from that, to add to the collection, it really comes down to what you're looking for. So, I mean, you say no supercars. I think maybe if it seems like you like muscle stuff. So I think that a Hellcat could be a lot of fun. They're, you know, a very different type of fun. Um, that could be something that, you know, you have a lot of punch down low in those. And I think that's a lot of fun. You also can get a Hellcat with a manual, which you cannot get in the GT 500. If you have the new version, um, the Camaro ZL one is another one worth considering. Cause you can get that with a stick, a little bit of a different experience. If you, you know, appreciate the high, high horsepower muscle stuff, but you want a stick that could be fun. Um, otherwise, you know, it, one other wild card is the Ram T-Rex. I think, you know, I've never really been into trucks. I review them on the channel. I respect them for what they can do, but I've never really wanted a truck since actually when I was a kid, I actually had a little thing for the Ram, um, whenever I was really young before I loved WRXs and stuff. Um, but the Ram T-Rex is the first truck that like, I'm like, man, if I needed a truck or like could justify a truck and had also an extra 80 grand to spend on a truck, uh, T-Rex is uh super sweet i'm hoping to get one of those to review here um sometime this winter um i've been itching to drive one of those but um yeah that could be another fun option if you want something really different from your current stuff um but obviously it's not going to be quite as sporty as those but it could be a fun choice as, as well um but there's all kinds of good stuff uh you know depending on what your price range is there's we're spoiled for choice these days so many fun cars out there from so many different companies um the trucking car guy thank you so much for the super chat he says hey matt congrats to you and beth on the baby any update on the new charger challenger keep up the good work really enjoy the channel thank you for watching i really appreciate it um, I have not heard any new, new updates on the Charger and the Challenger. The last that I heard, it wasn't going to be on the Julia platform anymore. Um, and then, you know, so there's, I think there was two rumors of them either, either doing something like ground up, totally new platform, or doing something where they heavily, heavily revise the current old platform. 
modernize it in many ways, and then uh, just do a new thing. And actually, th one thing that could kind of be construed as being new is that, you know, the Stellantis merger was just approved this week. And so that's, you know, Peugeot joining in with FCA and stuff. And that they were talking about how the CEO of Peugeot um, really loves cost cutting. He wants everything to be on the same platform and he wants to really cut down all that kind of stuff. And with him, uh, you know, behind the wheel, you know, calling the shots, I don't think they're going to approve a totally new ground up Charger and Challenger because um, they know that they can sell these current Challengers and Chargers just fine. No one really complains. Everyone loves what they're doing with them. I know eventually people are going to want a new one, but I mean, you know, they've gone this long <laughs> and no one's really complained. I mean, Toyota Land Cruiser fans are all the proof you need. You know, you can have basically the same vehicle from 2006 and charge, you know, $90,000 for it. And people still snap them up and love them and will defend them to their grave. So, um, you know, I don't know, but I, with him in charge now, I wouldn't hold my breath for a completely new thing. I would mentally prepare for a heavily rework, reworked version of the current platform. Now that doesn't mean it's going to be the same vehicle and just have new headlights. Like it could be heavily redone. Like, I mean, where they swap out parts of the frame to be lighter, um, you know, heavy redo things, you know, completely redesigning the suspension, all those types of things could potentially still be on the table, um, but it would still kind of have that same old bones. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad. I mean, look at, you know, like the alpha platform, for example, that debuted with the CTS and stuff like that, but then they managed to, you know, redo it with the alpha two and they did a few nips and tucks at GM to make it a little bit better. And now you have the fantastic handling CT five V that I just reviewed. Uh, the CT four V is fantastic. Both of them drive better than the ATS and the CTS. And, um, you know, I'm excited for the Blackwing versions of those, but you know, you, that's proof that you can keep doing the same thing, make it still totally fresh, totally new, completely different, uh, you know, dimensions. The CT five, I think is a couple inches longer than a CTS, I think. Um, you know, so there's all those types of changes you can make and make it feel totally new, even if the underpinnings are a little bit old. And I know that some people will just hear that headline of, you know, has a relation to the old challenger and people are like, Oh, it's old. Never mind, Forget it. It's crap. But you know, it could still be really good. But um, yeah, I have no clue though. I still think it's going to be a ways off. I, the last I heard was maybe it'll be, you know, launching the same time as the new Mustang for 2023 calendar year. Um, I've also heard 2024 could be when it could come calendar year. So you might be looking at another three years for the new one. So I would not wait around. I would, if there's a challenger or charger you like right now, I'd get it and then flip it in three years or something if you're really in love with the new one and what they did with it. But um, I'm a firm believer in living in the now, especially after having a tree you know, fall on me and nearly uh, knock me out. Um, you know, there's a if you can do it now, enjoy whatever car is on the market now. You can always upgrade later. You can always you know figure something out down the road. But live in the moment and enjoy stuff while we have it. Um, we have. Um, Gabriel says Dodge needs to make all wheel drive as an option in the Hellcats. Um, yeah, it would be awesome for them to do that. From what I've heard, the reason why there's no all wheel drive is because um, to make it fit in the Challenger, um, they had to actually lift it up for the Challenger GT V6 version. Um, so if you watch my Challenger GT review, you will actually see, you know, I showed how it's like an inch higher than a regular Challenger. And they did that so that you had enough clearance there for that all-wheel drive drivetrain. And I know they said they had to fix the transmission tunnel and there would, it would be really tough to do that in the Charger. Now they did have an uh, all-wheel drive regular V8 Charger and they were able to do that for a few years. I'm not sure why they got rid of that since they did have that and it worked in this current generation Charger. Um, that was just the 5.7 though. But um, so, yeah, I don't know. They'll ever do it with the Hellcats. I mean, they love one-upping themselves, so maybe they'll try and find a way to, you know, make it work. For last I heard, they would have to completely redesign the transmission tunnel area, and that would involve an interior redesign and be a heavily redone thing. Um, so maybe the next generation version that could be in the in the cards there. But as of right now, I think that might be something we'll be waiting a long time for. Um, and um, we have another question here: says the best smiles per gallon uh, car you've driven in 2020. Uh, I, you know, any of, any of the Hellcats always put a smile on my face just because there are tons of wheel spin, tons of craziness. You get the supercharger wine, all those types of things make it a little bit more fun than the GT 500, in my opinion. Um, cause that, you know, has the wheel spin, but you don't get the supercharger wine, unfortunately, in those new ones. 
Um, so that's kind of, I think, one of the best ones. And the red eye was just bonkers, even more so. So that was probably one of the, the best ones as far as that goes. Um, and then, you know, I mean, any of, like you watched my top 10 video. That's kind of my top 10 vehicles I really enjoyed in 2020. Um, I just posted that a few days ago if you missed that. Um, the Lexus LC500 convertible was another one last year that just was pure bliss. I loved every minute of driving that thing. Uh, that screaming Lexus VA with a top down, like, whew. Few things in 2020 were more enjoyable than hearing that. That was fantastic. Um, but anyway, other questions. Uh, Joe Taka uh, says, hi, Matt. Thanks for doing these live streams. Have you heard of any updates with the upcoming Mazda rear-wheel drive platform and their inline six engines? I'm hoping Mazda has a positive future. I think they do as well. Um, they're just, the only thing with Mazda is that um, financially they're not doing super well. Um, but I think that they do have a promising future and I think that they will make it and they'll be good. Um, and the only thing, you know, I've heard, you know, what we've seen in the past few months, I think is all that I've, I know about their, uh, you know, new upcoming stuff. I think, you know, it's going to be the inline six. There's rumors it'll be, you know, a naturally aspirated version and then also a turbocharged version. Um, and that rear wheel drive platform will allow them to be much longer. So you're going to have more spacious and more elegant looking vehicles. Um, and uh, that's about all that I know. You know, we've heard that now the CX, Five, which will probably be called the CX-50, will be on that new platform as well. Um, so you're going to have a real like BMW X3 competitor with that, um, which is going to be pretty impressive, and I'm looking forward to that. Uh, but that's about it. I think Mazda, though, they're doing a really good job, even though their stuff is kind of dated at this point. I think that uh, it's you know very impressive stuff still, and even though it is dated, it's really, really good. And their brand-new stuff they're coming out with here is really, really top-notch, and I'm excited. I'm actually... Uh, I think at like, the very beginning of February, I'm going to have a CX-30 Turbo um, to review for a few days. And I'm excited to you know, have the same goodness that I enjoyed in the Mazda 3 Turbo I reviewed a few months ago. Have that in the CX-30 is going to be fantastic with that fantastic Bose stereo I was talking about a few minutes ago. And all the great power and the great looks of the CX-30. It's going to be a really nice package, I think. So I'm excited to do that as well. Uh, Art Vandalay says, why don't you do burnouts in the bullets? Because uh, Michelin Pilot Sport 4Ss are expensive. <laughs> That's basically why. I am not made of money, and my videos do not get enough views to cover uh, doing a burnout, you know? And it, maybe I'd break even if I was lucky, but, um, you know, I think those 275s in the rear on the bullet, I believe they're like 350 a pop or something like that. So, yeah, like just wanting to burn off $700, I am not that much of a baller. <laughs> I wish I was. I'm not, I'm not one of these big time YouTubers that can just, you know, do that kind of stuff for views and laugh it off. Um, to me, I have to be a little more frugal with my money. I got a baby on the way. We're trying to move. We're trying to do that kind of stuff. And uh, so that is why I don't do crazy things like that. I mean, it'd be tons of fun to do burnouts in the blood. I'd love to do a complete like shot for shot remake of the bullet chase. And I would love to, you know, do smoke your reverse burnouts like they do in bullet and jump it over hills and everything else. I'd love to do all that crazy stuff, but uh, money just does not allow it. So um, yeah, maybe someday if <laughs> the channel gets to a point where I can afford to burn tires for the fun of it, um, I would love to. Um, it would be nice for an intro. I agree. It would be great for bullet videos and uh, it'd be a lot of fun. I'd love to, but uh, <laughs> It's just the reality of my situation right now. So um, someone says, buy used tires for a burnout video. I could do that. Um, you know, what I thought about doing is once the tires do get really low on the bullet, doing a quick little burnout, you know, nothing that's enormous and, you know, blows up the tires. But, uh, you know, could do, you know, one right before I replace them as long as I can limp it to a tire shop afterwards to do that. But I also don't have a deserted place near a tire shop where I could do a huge burnout without getting in trouble either. So that's another thing I'd have to work out, but I may try and do a burnout someday. Although Ford is weird about their warranties. I think they said that if you, I think if you use line lock in the bullet, you actually, they might void your warranty, which should be a real buzzkill. But I think that might actually be, something that they do enforce. Um, now the bullet is going to be this year, uh, will be three years old. And so my general warranty will be, a, will be done on it then, but at the powertrain warranty, which I'm assuming is what, you know, the line lock would void. Um, that's a five year, 60,000 mile warranty. So I still have about two more years before I can just not worry about kissing my warranty goodbye. 
Um, but yeah, so that's another thing to consider. All very unfun stuff that I wish I was rich enough to not have to worry about, but I have to worry about warranties and tires and all that boring stuff. Um, but yeah, anyway. Um, so uh, Samuel says, why can't you use Turo and write it off as a business exp expense uh, for that Lincoln that you wanted to review? I could do that. Um, so, and that's actually how I got started reviewing cars is I rented a few cars. Um, I did have some other cars that were friends vehicles and stuff like that, but I actually did rent a few vehicles on Zipcar back when I really first started the channel, like back in 2012. Um, and I did some reviews that way. Uh, I don't know if there is a Continental available on Turo in my area, but the Turo actually, that's how I did the Model S uh, review is I was actually on a trip for a wedding over a weekend and needed a rental car anyway. And so I went on Turo and that's, I got the, uh, this is not an ad, but I went on Turo and got the, uh, the Model S there and figured I could, you know, do it as a review, write it off. And um, so that was, you know, nice to do once, but Another uh, money related thing, you know, uh, renting a car for a weekend. I have very thin margins on the reviews. You know, they don't get huge views on most of them. And so, um, you know, dropping a couple hundred bucks on a, to review a car and then have it do 10,000 views, like I would lose money on that. So um, that's another thing. You know, there's a lot of cars I'd love to review and I could probably review them on Turo, but, uh, you know, it's just a, it's a cost thing and a business thing of, you know, trying to figure it out. Now, if there was a car, like if I could rent on Turo a Mark IV Supra, which is a car I've been trying to review ever since I started reviewing cars and no one's ever offered one to me remotely close to my area. But like if there was a, you know, a Mark IV Supra on Turo for 200 bucks a day or something, 100% I would go rent it for a day because that would easily, you know, uh, make sure that it broke even. But uh, it's something that usually, you know, like I said, unless the video gets huge views, it does not pay, you know, huge. I mean, the only reason why, you know, I'm able to do this as my full-time job is that I've done over 450 car reviews and there are all those videos still get views every single day. And so that adds up, you know, so that's how uh, I'm able to do it and not be getting, you know, hundred thousand views of video. But um, yeah, so again, just more of the uh, behind the scenes reality to running a YouTube channel. Um, all right. So Jason says, what do you think are some of the best used performance cars to buy for roughly 40 grand? Also considering reliability. Um, it kind of comes down to what your preferences are. Again, that's kind of the one thing and it's hard to give blanket uh, recommendations, but some of my favorites, um, if you're worried about reliability, um, I would say stuff like a Lexus RCF, uh, Lexus GSF. If you can get one of those, I think those are close to 40 grand. Um, that would be another fantastic, uh, I think any of the Lexus V8 stuff are some, just cause they sound so good. They're still really comfortable. They're a nice blend of sportiness and really good handling and still being great daily drivers. Um, if you're, especially if reliability is high on your list, I think those are fantastic. And so, you know, RCF, GSF, whether you want four doors or two, um, I think the GSF actually even handles better than the RCF. GSF is such an underrated car. And I went on about that in my review. I think it was about a year or so ago when I had the last GSF right before they got rid of it. Um, that was, that was a really fantastic car. So, I mean, there's lots of others I could you know spend all night talking about, but um, I think the GSF would be one of the best ones if you're wanting something for four doors around 40 grand. That's reliable. Fantastic car handles. So, so good. Sounds so good. Nationally aspirated V8, another car that could potentially be a collectible someday because very few people bought them. They're fantastic. And I think eventually people will come around to that because whenever everyone's M5 is falling apart in 10 years because German cars like to uh, be lease vehicles and you know sometimes don't last much longer beyond that. And the GSF will continue to be strong 10 years from now. I think that's where you're going to see those. You know, the M5s will just continue to appreciate and the GSF will take over and just take off, I think, down the road long term. But um, yes, yeah, so that's another one that I really love. But um, yeah, Samuel, uh, surprise, I said the GSF handles better than the RCF. Yeah, I think it just, the GSF actually just felt like it had better like weight distribution, felt a little less heavy, even though I know the numbers probably show that I'm sure the GSF is heavier than the RCF, but the GSF just really um, was super well sorted. I don't think I'm the only one that thinks that, though. I think. I think actually whenever I talked to um, Jason from Engineering and Explained, I don't remember and don't quote me on this, but I think that because we actually had the RCF track edition um, whenever we did the one ABA event um, back about a year and a half ago. And I think that he's, I think I remember him saying that he preferred the GSF the way that drove over the RCF track edition. I could be wrong. 
Um, but I think, yeah, I don't think I'm alone in saying the GSF is better than the RCF, uh, but they're both fantastic for sure. Um, Pistol Pete says, Hey Matt, what are some of your sources for weekly auto industry news? Um, I follow a bunch of different news uh, sites on Twitter. So actually if you, um, on Twitter, if you see, I only follow like, I don't know, 40 or 50 people on Twitter, but if you see who I follow on Twitter, those are all my news sources for the most part. Um, aside from, you know, if something else randomly pops up, you know, here or there, but it's generally all the big sites that, you know, cover car news. So it's, you know, car and driver, um, you know, uh, Road and Track, uh, Motor Trend, uh, Auto Blog, stuff like that. Motor One's pretty good, um, and then also like Auto Car for a lot of the European stuff. You know, they cover everything in the UK and all that, and and kind of give me my dose of European um, automotive news to kind of you know stay abreast of all that stuff as well. But uh, yeah, so that's kind of most of it. Is just most of those uh, big ones, and then I kind of just condense all that stuff and get the most interesting stories and I put that into the weekly update. But um, yeah, I'm glad so many of you really have enjoyed the weekly updates and are so supportive of those. Uh, it really uh, is awesome. And so many of you, it's like your Friday routine. And I am very thankful to everyone that uh, you know is excited for those. Uh, Jonathan Johnson says, being that you had a very early build EcoBoost S550 back in the day, would you prefer that to a Focus ST as a daily? I remember the EB had some hiccups, but was modded. Curious on your viewpoint. So I think... It's tough. I think what I would do is avoid an early build EcoBoost, but I think that they kind of worked out. They made some very quiet little subtle changes to the block and stuff, I think, in 2016. And then 2017, they did a little bit. And then 2018, you know, had a little bit more torque, I think. Um, so I would probably go for an 18 EcoBoost. I think at that point, they probably got most of the teething issues worked out. I have not stayed up on the EcoBoost uh, community to see, you know, how all that played out. I think, you know, especially the first year though, it wasn't even modified EcoBoost. There were some stock ones that were blowing up a little more often than they should. Um, and there were some that were smoking when they were still stock and they were having all kinds of weird like PCV issues and stuff. Um, I don't know. I don't know how I, again, I have not kept up to date on that. Now the Focus RS, you know, those people have the same engine. So they probably have a little bit more experience even than even the EcoBoost guys maybe do. I don't know. But Regardless, I don't know. I don't love that engine. I know that's also the engine that's going to be in the Bronco. That's the four-cylinder Bronco engine is that EcoBoost Mustang engine. So I hope for all those Bronco people that they have worked out the issues with that motor because I'm still a little leery of it. I have to, I'd have to do a lot more research. Um, but I, I think the Focus ST motor has been fairly good and holds up to mods fairly well. I don't think it's bulletproof or anything, but I think it, it seems like it's been a pretty decent motor. So I... I probably see. I love the Mustang, though, so I would probably just try and find a way to get a V6 um, Mustang if I wanted to get something that wasn't a V8 Mustang. I think I would actually much rather prefer the V6 over the EcoBoost. Um, and then, as far as Focus ST, I think that's a great choice as well. Um, but I think I just I love the Mustang, so I'd just go for the Mustang probably. Hopefully, that answers your question in a roundabout way. Um, all right, so uh, people talking about the Ram T Rex, I. Love that. Um, yeah, the Ram T-Rex. I hope I get one here in the next few weeks. Fingers crossed. Marco says, any uh, future other YouTube collabs uh, or YouTuber collabs? So I'm hoping to, you know, COVID has kind of stopped any kind of socializing whatsoever. So um, once, you know, that gets back to normal, that's, you know, whenever I'll be doing more collabs again. Um, you know, as far as I know, there's no press trips happening or anything like that. Um, and so, yeah, it's just a matter of, you know, hoping that things get better. I would love to, you know, uh, collab with some more in the future, especially Sofian from Redline Reviews actually, uh, is a little bit closer to me now than he used to be as far as uh, location wise. So I'd love to do some more collabs with him here this year if, uh, you know, conditions allow. Um, and, uh, I'm hoping to do more ABA events. Hopefully if that works out, you know, some of you have, you know, followed the channel for a few years know, um, the ABA is a group that I'm a part of. It's the automotive video association. And so I'm in it with, uh, Jason from engineering explained, uh, 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 Roman from TFL car. Um, they're in it. Alex on autos is in it. Um, Nick miles, who does a bunch of TV and radio stuff. He's in it. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's, a uh, couple others as well, but it's, you know, a bunch of us and, uh, you know, I'm hoping we do more stuff all together this year. I think that'd be really great too. Um, but yeah, so that's, uh, all I, I really don't have anything planned. I wish I did, but, uh, as of right now, don't have anything there. Um, so yeah. Um, 
Oh, and Immutable uh, Dew says, really like the Zoom calls with TFL, uh, Alex, and Redline. Yeah, that was really cool. Right when uh, COVID first uh, kind of started, uh, you know, we all did that one Zoom call. And that was that was really fun. I'd love to uh, do another one of those. I don't know if they've talked about doing any of those again, but I'd be totally down for doing another one. Uh, it was great hanging out with all of them. Sorry, I just got a phone call here. Um, all right, other questions? Um, yeah, other people said, yeah, Jason says he enjoyed the Zoom collab as well. Yeah, I would totally be down for that if other people, uh, you know, would love to do those types of things. I have no clue how to do that. I don't have like a premium Zoom account or whatever you need for doing an unlimited uh, Zoom call and stuff. But uh, I would love to, yeah, join if anyone ever wants to do anything like that. That'd be cool. Um, all right. So we have uh, Ryan says, hi, Matt. Happy New Year. Um, is Volkswagen likely to build an electric Beetle? I hope so. If you watch the one weekly update uh, not too long ago, you know, they're talking about doing cheaper electric vehicles. And I really, really hope, you know, they're saying that they're wanting to do stuff that's smaller than the ID3 and um, also stuff in addition to the ID1 and ID2, which they haven't even revealed yet, but are coming. And I'm like, hello, you want some cheap people's car that's electric? Make it a Beetle. It's your whole thing. I know that no one's really into the Beetle anymore and the last one sold terribly and stuff. But, um, Ah, I don't know. I'm just a nostalgic person. I'm always like super nostalgic. So I, I would like nothing more than to see a new beetle with little round headlights running around with the engine and the, you know, the motor in the back, a frunk again, and a little cheap, you know, tiny beetle, an actual small beetle. Um, I would love that. So fingers crossed. I don't know if they will. Um, I feel like they got to be tempted to do it though. It just, it's too perfect of a, you know, uh, collaboration like it just makes too much sense i just hope they finally do it especially i think the way that we could send the message to them is whenever they, they have already said they're going to do the id buzz which is going to be the electric volkswagen bus and that's all going to be super retro and if people buy those electric buses like crazy and are you know really strong with like we like retro and we like electric volkswagens if they buy tons of those things i think that will guarantee an electric beetle if that flops or if that doesn't do as well as they're hoping, um, then you can probably forget about it and they'll just do, you know, more bland hatchbacks and stuff like that. But we'll have to wait and see. Um, I hope they do though. Isaac, thank you so much for the super chat. It just says happy new year. I hope you have a happy new year as well. 2021 is off to a better start for all of us here. Uh, we'll have to see what this year brings, but, uh, 2020 set a pretty low bar. So I don't think it's going to be much harder to, uh, you know, go beyond what 2020 did, but we'll have to wait and see. Um, because who knows, uh, the world is crazy. Just when you think it can't get any worse, it does. So we'll have to see. But uh, anyway, uh, fast line says he wishes Dodge had a convertible. Me too. I think that would be cool. You know, there was talks of them doing a Barracuda and like a convertible version of a challenger or something that never happened. Um, and, you know, there's been a few dealers that have made, like, custom-built convertible challengers, which are super cool. But I don't know why they never did it. I know convertibles don't sell very well, but, I mean, considering both the Mustang and the Camaro offer a convertible, and it's great for rental fleets. If they want to, you know, sell them to a bunch of, you know, Hertz offices in Florida and stuff, they could, you know, make a decent business case, I think, for a challenger convertible. But uh, they just never did. Maybe that would be something they'll do for the last version because, you know, there's talks, too, with the next three years of challengers, there's going to be new variants and aside from, you know, making it more horsepower to actually do something different, they could try and, you know, reinforce it, uh, do some type of quick, you know, convertible thing with the Challenger, do that as a new variant. That could be very cool. So who knows? But uh, I wish they did as well. Ryan says, yes, we need some cool and unique EVs. Wish we had the Honda E. You and me both. Uh, that's another, if, if the Honda E came to the States, that would be very high on the list of dad cars that I would consider. I would love to have a Honda E. I have a friend. I actually have multiple people that like say they have cash in hand. They would buy a Honda E tomorrow if Honda brought it over here. Um, so I, I wish, uh, wish that came in. Yeah. Dustin's asking, are they for sure doing the bus? Yes, they did confirm they are doing the bus. I don't think it's coming until either 2024 or 2025 calendar year. So it's a ways off. It's not the first thing on their list, but they are, they did commit to doing it. I, unless I'm misremembering, but I'm pretty sure I remember seeing them saying they're committing to it. I mean, things could have changed because I think they confirmed it maybe two or three years ago. But yeah, from what I saw, it's definite. They're definitely doing the bus, which is going to be super, super cool. It's going to be awesome. Maybe that could be a dad car. We'll have to see. Um, could be very practical at least. Um, 
Joshua says, what do you think of the new Huracan STO? It looks really sweet. Seems really, really awesome. I, I uh, think it's pretty cool. I mean, they're always doing new versions of the Lamborghinis, so I get a little burned out with new versions of supercars because it's like every week there's a new one, and um, I can't even keep up with all of them at this point. But, uh, yeah, it's more fun cars out there, the better. You know, that's how I look at it. Um, Gabriel says, what is Kia doing with the refresh Stinger? Um, I covered it in a weekly update. Um, they're doing the two and a half liter turbo motor is going to replace, or the, it's the more powerful. Yeah. The two and a half liter motor is going to be replacing the two liter motor in the current base stinger. So it's going to be the motor you're seeing in the Genesis G80 and stuff like that. That will be in the stinger, um, do like 300 horsepower. So you'll have a closer gap between that and the stinger GT, you know, which is still going to be about the same horsepower aside from, I think it gains like two horsepower from an active exhaust, but that's it. <clears throat> it's going to have quilted seats on the inside. The screen in the middle is going to be the new 10 inch screen instead of the eight inch one. Um, and uh, digital gauges, I think are, are coming to the States, I think finally. And I think one or two other things, uh, trim is a little bit nicer, but I think that's about it. So uh, all nice improvements, and I'm hoping to be able to re review one of those. I think they're supposed to come sometime around June or July, I thought I heard. I'm not sure, but, yeah, so hopefully we get that soon. Um, Robert says, do you think Infinity is going to die in the near future? I don't think so. I know a lot of people think that's going to happen, but the thing that I think people don't realize is that the luxury brands are like the um, golden child of these car companies because that's where your profit is. I mean, you know, if you think about it, the luxury brands are the ones that have the huge profit margins because yes, you, the materials that you're using are a little bit more expensive. The technology is a little bit more expensive, but you know, they, I, I'm pretty sure they make, I don't know for a fact, but I'm pretty sure they make way more of a profit even on an infinity currently than they do on a Nissan. And so it's all about that profit margin. And um, you know, those margins are much better on, on luxury vehicles. So, you know, from, Everything that I've seen from all the interviews with the executives, they all say that, you know, that's going to be much improved. Some have said, you know, it's going to be Nissan Plus, which, excuse me, is like concerning, but they say it's not just going to be like an Altima with infinity badges. It's going to be, you know, a much heavily reworked thing, um, but it's going to feel premium and stuff. And so I'm hoping that, you know, they really do turn themselves around, but I don't think they're going to kill off infinity. I think, they will keep it around, even if they keep it around with a bunch of dinosaur models for a while, just because it will it will pay off for them, I think, if they do the investment. And I think that, um, you know, it's just going to be the best path forward for Nissan to be profitable if they can get Infinity back to being, you know, where it used to be and being a little bit more desirable. I think that's going to be the, the ticket because, you know, they don't make a ton of money selling, you know, rogues at you know, 25,000 bucks. There's just not much of a margin there. You know, it's all about volume with those, but the infinity, you don't need the huge volume. So you might be like, Oh, well, they're not selling a whole lot. Um, but they're selling decently for, you know, how old they are and stuff. And uh, I think part of that is because they have really good deals on them, but you know, they're doing better than you might expect. If you look at the car um, sales figures every month for infinity, they're for old cars, they're doing pretty well. So I think just a little bit of investment, uh, you know, have the new Nissan stuff with the infinity, uh, niceties, I think they could do still pretty well. So I think they're going to stick around. I'm, I'm hopeful for them. Um, and uh, so we have uh, Jonathan says, I still think your review of uh, that dude in blues GT in 2014 is one of the best S197 reviews on YouTube. The comparison with the 5.0 BRZ was awesome. I'm thank thankful that you even remember that because that video is kind of one of the ones that uh, hasn't hasn't really lived on much. There's been uh, actually all my other old older Mustang videos continue to get pretty good views, but that one just kind of been sitting on the shelf, kind of dusty, and not too many people have been watching that review in the past year or two. Um, but I I love that. I mean, that was really my first taste of those newer Mustangs. Um, and actually, yeah, one of my first tastes of Mustangs in general was his. Mustang. I'm still so thankful that he uh, you know, actually came up to Pittsburgh and let me review it. Um, that was a, such a cool, uh, you know, I guess, trip for him to make. And it was a lot of fun to show him around Pittsburgh and stuff uh, way back in the early days, back before, uh, you know, all of us uh, were, you know, larger channels and all over the country and all that kind of stuff. So um, it's always great catching up with David, too. I was able to catch up with him on the Supra event about a year and a half ago and uh, one or two other events in the past. Uh, he's a, he's a great dude, but uh, yeah, that was a, that was a really fun video. And I agree. I think that was, I actually think that's one of my better uh, reactions over the years. That's kind of stood up as still being one of the ones. Cause it was, it was just like, I was all about the Mustangs at that point. It was like 
pure shock and surprise though with just how loud and crazy it was and how fast it was it was uh that was so much fun i have so many good memories from that so thanks for for bringing up those memories that was great um so yeah jason has linked it there very kindly thanks for linking that jason if anyone wants to watch it you can go check it out there um it has a lot of fun but uh cruising rsx says matt i need a subcompact my choices are mini cooper s honda fit ex or toyota yaris um so the Cooper S is by far the most fun and sportiest one of those three. The problem is if you, uh, I don't know if you've followed the channel back when I had a mini Cooper S, I had one for six months. I did uh, updates on it. You can go, there's a whole playlist of mini updates and you can see my whole uh, fiasco with that mini. It was great for the first few months and the last few months it fell apart and left me stranded. It overheated. Um, it, uh, the water pump went, there was all kinds of little issues with that thing. And it just, I just lost faith in that car real quick. Um, which is such a bummer because I really planned to keep that car for a while. I loved it. My friend had really good uh, luck with his Cooper S and I just did not. So if you're looking at R56 is if you go for like maybe a late, late generation, uh, uh, Cooper S, um, of the R56 generation, one of those, like maybe if you would go like 2011 or later, you might be safe. I don't even know though, because that whole just generation had a lot of design flaws. I think um, the newer ones, uh, this newest generation, I think is a lot better because it has a lot more BMW mechanicals, which isn't the gold bar either, but it's a lot better than what Mini was doing with the R56s, I think. Um, so I think that would definitely be um, a good pick as well, uh, you know, to get one of those new ones if you can afford it. Um, otherwise, though, if you want something that's you know going to be reliable, I think the Honda Fit. I have not driven a Honda Fit in a long time, and I've never actually even reviewed one on the channel, but I have driven them in the past. I think they drive a little bit more fun than the uh, Yaris. I think the Yaris is a little less exciting than the Fit. So I would say Cooper S if you're brave. Otherwise, Fit uh, would be my pick. Um, so hopefully that helps. And thank you for the little super chat afterwards as well. I really appreciate that. And uh, if you have any other questions, yeah, feel free to ask them. I'll try and get to them as well. Um, Bob's asking, are you planning on buying an SUV soon or a sporty hatchback or a sports sedan since you're going to have a baby soon? Um, I'm planning on not buying anything currently, um, because I get a lot of press cars. And so most of the time I'm driving those and most of those are four doors. Um, whenever I don't have a press vehicle, I can also use uh, Beth's car. She has a Mercedes C300. That's four doors. That's going to be uh, the primary baby carrier. And so that's what we're going to be using. Um, so, Probably not going to buy a third car unless uh, I find myself in a scenario where I, you know, need to be driving around the baby a bunch and um, it gets tiresome in the bullet because I can't also fit a car seat in the back of the bullet. It's not comfortable. I do have to push the passenger seat like all the way forward to get it to fit. Um, and but my friend actually had a Mustang and did do that, and it's not fun, but he did it. And so you know, in a pinch, I can even use the bullet. So I feel like I can't justify an extra car right now, even though it'd be fun to buy extra cars uh, if I had the money, but um, I think I'm just going to hold off. And if the situation changes, then I will definitely, you know, look into getting something. What it would be, I don't know. And like I said, there's a bunch of things that I'm considering between SUVs, sedans, hatchbacks. There's several in the running from various different, um, you know, cars that I'm, I would like to have if I need a, a dad car, but we'll have to wait and see for now though. I'm just going to hold off. Um, Josh is asking, will you get a new F-150 hybrid as a press vehicle? Um, I'm hoping to review one. I have requested the new F-150 from the press fleet office. Hopefully they have one in the fleet here soon and I'll be able to review it. Um, but as of now, it's not scheduled. I don't have anything set in stone, but hopefully it does come uh, eventually because I'm very curious. I'm very eager to try it. I think it seems like it's really cool. And the new F-150 obviously is going to be, you know, it's a really big deal as well. So I want to get one of those regardless of whether it's the hybrid or not. I want to get one to review. So hopefully I get one here sometime not in the not too distant future we'll just have to wait and see um but yeah i definitely want to review one for sure um aerosol says minivan and i am not doing a minivan even though the new crop of minivans is very good uh there is i'm not doing carpool so i don't need to have seven seats anyway so i think the most i would get would be an suv but that would be about it um um yeah, so uh, Cal says Beth's the baby carrier for nine months and the Mercedes will take care of the rest. <laughs> that is correct. That's a good joke. I appreciate it, Carl. Or Cal, I believe. I misread that. Sorry, Cal. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we have a Mystical Gamer says, um, 
I guess they're having a discussion here. Sorry, I missed that. Um, but yeah, talking about cop cars, that would be, I'd love to do a Crown Vic someday. It's another vehicle I've been wanting to review for a while. I never did. Um, hopefully I can maybe get one of those offered to me someday. Um, Jonathan says, would it be worth trading my 18 SI for the Type R? Yes. Yes, a million times yes. If you can afford it, do it. The Type R is fantastic. It's way better than the SI. There's no rev hang. The engine's way more fun, way more character. It handles way better. Um, the suspension with its adjustability is way more adjustable than the SI. Um, you have the better practicality of the hatch. It's more special. It's probably going to depreciate less. It will be worth more down the road. Um, and it's just as reliable, it seems. And yeah, there's basically no downside to upgrading from a SI to a Type R. 100%, if you can afford it, yeah, I would do that tomorrow for sure. That would be amazing. Um, and uh, I love the Type R I lived with for a week this past year. It was a ton of fun. Um, uh, Chi is asking CX-5 Touring or Carbon Edition. Um, that comes down to what kind of equipment you're looking for. And the darker look of the Carbon Edition is kind of cool. Um, so, yeah, it just comes down to that. I personally would recommend the turbo motor if you're an enthusiast just because obviously you have a lot more power and it's really punchy and feels really nice. And also the turbo versions are a little bit more luxurious um, in those higher trims. So you get a little bit more toys, you know, get cooled seats and, you know, one or two other things, which are nice. Um, so that would be, uh, you know, a nice thing if you're up for one of those. But uh, all versions of the CX-5 are really nice. They're really great SUVs and one of my top picks in the compact segment still. Um all right, so we have uh, about five more minutes here or so probably to go. Uh, I'll keep answering questions, though, here. Um, Josh is asking how many miles are on the bullet. It is almost 15,000 miles. It's like 14,970, I think, is what I was at uh, whenever I drove it yesterday. Um, so it's slowly but surely getting there. COVID uh, put a damper on all the road trips. I'm hoping I can do more road trips this year and uh, get some more miles on it because I only managed to put, I think maybe 3000 miles on it in 2020, which is really a bummer since in 2019, I put like 10,000 miles on it or something like that, which is much more, uh, you know, in line with what I want to be doing and not, you know, keep it as a garage queen. That's, it always makes me sad going into the garage and seeing the bullet just sitting there, not doing anything. Um, all right. So, um, MR 84 says, what do you think of the new G 80 M three? Um, so, you know, I, I did cover it in the weekly update on the looks and stuff. I obviously have not driven one yet, so I don't know how it drives. Um, you know, whenever I first saw the grill, I did not like it. As time has gone on, I don't hate it as much as I used to. Um, maybe it will grow on me more. I still don't love it. I still don't think it's beautiful, um, but I think in the right colors. I think the problem was they launched it in all those goofy colors, which are fun and exciting, and they make for great, you know, thumbnails and stuff on YouTube videos. But they're, you know, I think doing it in a more normal color and helping that girl to blend in a little bit better, I think would make it a lot more likable, in my opinion. Um, so yeah, and I do love that they're offering it with a manual. I think that is super respectable and that alone is enough for me to endorse the M3. Just the fact that they're doing that, please, anyone who's curious about the new M3, if you have the money and you're looking for something like that, buy a new manual M3, keep the manuals alive. You send that message by buying a new car with that manual in it. And so I love them for that. And if, if I was in the market for a, you know, German luxury sedan, German luxury sports sedan, I would probably pick the M3 just for the manual, even with the front end on it, because I know it's going to drive fantastic. Um, you know, I love that BMW motor and the super end stuff. I know it's a newer version in the M3, but um, I think they just, they make fantastic motors. They make really good handling vehicles. And the fact you can get it with a manual, two thumbs up for me, I would 100%. I would probably go for an M3 over an E63 and stuff like that, uh, personally. Even though the E63 is nice and stuff and having the all-wheel drive is great, I would just go for the rear-wheel drive manual M3, I think. Um, Smile per mile. Um, it says, hi, Matt. Uh, have you seen the recent Instagram post that BMW USA deleted of an M2 CS drifting with a V10 audio directly from Lamborghini? I cringed a lot. Yeah, I saw that Jason Camisa called that out on his Instagram and oh man, that was hilarious. I there's there's so many commercials where I, you know, and it doesn't even have to be a car commercial, but especially car commercials, since you know, we know a little bit more about cars than the average person, where I call stuff out and I'm like, this is such crap. Like, and it's just it's so funny that 
you know, not only, you know, I, I get that, you know, some people make mistakes and stuff. That's totally fine. But it's just kind of funny how there's like, for example, with that, you know, commercial and Jason pointed this out in his Instagram post as well, but there's like a bunch of huge executives at an ad agency or whoever that did that. And, you know, people that edited that and everything, you know, that everyone, you know, they don't just like post something sporadically. Like it's, it's reviewed by millions of people. I mean, even like my Lego sponsored video that I did with Lego, you know, like it, when was that? Like maybe a year ago or so. Like that, like had to have multiple people review it to make sure that Lego liked it and that the ad agency liked it, made sure that everything was copacetic with everybody and everyone gave it a thumbs up. And then it was like, okay, now you post it. So that whole process they went through with that Instagram post for the uh, M2CS and lots of very smart, very wealthy, high powered people said, yeah, that is great. That is awesome. And it's like, you're working at BMW or you're working for BMW as their ad agency or their editor or whatever it is like, come on. Like I get that, you know, maybe they hire some Hollywood editor who has no clue about cars. And was like, Oh, that sounds like a cool engine sound. I got that in my little folder of car sounds on my computer. Let me drop that in. And uh, you know, and then a bunch of clueless executives were just like, yeah, great. Awesome. Cool. And no one bothered to pay attention, but you know, especially an enthusiast model, you're working at a car company. Like I can see if you want to pretend that your car is, you know, uh, self-driving or whatever nonsense you see in a lot of these commercials, like whatever. Um, but just the fact that they're, yeah, that got greenlit by multiple smart, rich, high powered people like, yeah, this is great. Yeah, this is great. What do you think? Yeah, it's great. And it all got through to the point where it was actually posted. And then they make a blunder like that. It's just, it was hilarious. Um, and that, that goes for lots of commercials. There's so many commercials I watch and I'm like, there was a whole boardroom of really smart really intelligent, you know, rich people that all were like, this is the best commercial ever. And I mean, whether it's a controversial thing that's like in poor taste or it's just something stupid, it's like you spent millions of dollars on this ad and that's what you came up with? Really? Like, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's funny, but um, it's just the way it goes. Sometimes some of these very high powered executives, um, you know, just aren't, uh, I don't know, just aren't actually top brass. <laughs> uh, anyway, we got a few more super chats here. So I want to um, answer those and then we will sign off here. So we have Dom. Uh, thank you so much for the super chat. He says, why do you think people were more upset uh, about an automatic only super, but not an automatic only GTR? That's a good question. I think a lot of people were upset about the GTR. I remember back when they launched the GTR, you know, 12 years ago, 13 years ago now at this point. Um, there was a lot of people that were upset about it, uh, especially since, you know, the whole uh, dual clutch thing was in its infancy back then. So none of them were really spectacular. But I think with the GTR, it kind of had this wow factor and had this crazy zero to 60 time, you know, because they launched and they were what, 60 or 65 grand for a GTR when they first came out. And everyone's like, wow, you get like 3.2 seconds zero to 60 for 65 grand. That was unheard of 12 or 13 years ago. And so I think it was this like technological tour de force of like, you know, what can we do for, you know, and it was, it was really like the C8 Corvette of 13 years ago. And, you know, so people were okay with it because it was just so cool. It was so impressive for its time. And it was just ho this whole, like, you know, science experiment basically with the GTR. And so, you know, that all kind of fit because you had this super high tech all wheel drive system, which was very, you know, um, you know, advanced. And then you had, you know, the dual clutch and everything else. There's lots of technology in the GTR. And so I think, they were able to kind of slip that by with that. And I think kind of Corvette has done that a little bit as well with the C8 where they've kind of, you know, I think there's a lot of people that are upset that it's not a manual, but I mean, they're still selling plenty of C8 Corvettes because it's like, wow, I got a mid engine car. It does like a three seconds here to 60 for 60 grand. I don't care that it's not a manual. I, I just want it. And I think all of the other good things, the mountain of good things override the fact that you don't have that manual. And so I think that's kind of the case there with the Supra. You didn't really have any of that special treatment. You know, the Supra was kind of uh, iffy from the get go for a lot of people just because of the collaboration, which was dumb, but a lot of people hated it for that reason. And then, you know, I think because people started with a negative outlook already on the Supra, it already started at a disadvantage. So then you start with, oh, well, it's a BMW. And then it's like, oh, and it's also an automatic BMW. Boo. And that's it. And so they, it just kind of was easier to hate because there was no hype for the Supra as much as there was. I mean, there was hype for the Supra, but not as much as the GTR when it first launched, I don't think, and not as much as like the C8 Corvette. So I think it was just easier to hate the Supra and the automatic was just another nail in the coffin for it currently. I really hope since they have all the parts in the BMW parts bin, I really hope 
they do a manual Supra and not just some super limited thing, but an actual normal production manual Supra. Um, I think that would really redeem it a lot with some people, but um, I've kind of given up hope on trying to convince people the Supra is good. Uh, it's another car that maybe won't be appreciated until it's gone. I don't know. Maybe it's like the NSX. People don't get the NSX for the most part. And it's a shame because it's a really fantastic car and it's super underappreciated for what it actually is and what it can do. But I think it's just the way it goes. Sometimes they're a little bit too ahead of the curve and, uh, you know, they just people love it 10 years later instead. Um, Jeffrey, thank you so much for the super chat. He says, hey, Matt, we just welcomed our baby girl in November. We wish you and Beth luck with yours. Don't be afraid to trade in the bullet for Pacifica. Well, congrats, Jeffrey, on your uh, new addition as well. That's awesome. Um, hopefully it's going well. Hopefully you are, uh, you know, getting some sleep. I've heard that's the number one thing everyone says is you're not going to sleep whenever you have a kid. So <clears throat> I hope that you are sleeping and doing well. Um, as far as the bullet for the Pacific, uh, yeah, I just, I can't do it. Uh, I know lots of people are joking about that, but um, the bullet is a keeper uh, is, unless something terrible happens and I can't afford it for some reason, but otherwise um, bullet is a keeper. Um, and uh, yeah, no Pacifica for me. I will gladly add, you know, something else if I need to, but uh, I'm not going to be swapping the bullet for a minivan. I would, I would die a little bit inside if I did that. I know some people have to, and they don't have a choice and that's totally fine. Um, and if that gets to be my position, then I you know, might have to make that choice as well. But I'm hoping I never have to. And I keep uh, the bullet around for a long time because I love that thing so much. Um, Steven, thank you so much for the super chat. Uh, again, he says, happy new year and a big thanks uh, for doing this. Uh, wish more often. Yeah, I, uh, I kind of would like to do these more often, but I also know the limits of, uh, people's attention span um, with uh, these. I, yeah, I think I actually did try and do them a little, I think I did like two a little bit more frequently. And the second one kind of dropped off with the viewership a little bit quicker. And it seems like with these doing them once a month, I kind of max out around the same kind of views, not like views are all that matters, but I, you know, I'm trying to grow the channel and stuff like that. And so I think overwhelming people with, with a lot of uh, live streams, you know, just probably wouldn't help. But this winter, you know, if things are a little bit slower, I might try and do some more if, you know, it's, it seems like it's pretty well received. That would be something I'd, I'd be totally open to. It's always fun hanging out with you guys and, and answering your questions and talking cars. It's um, kind of like a car meet without the actual cars and, uh, you know, without the actual interaction. But I, I love talking with all you guys on here. But, um, yeah, with that, we will call it a night here. But uh, thank you all so much for joining. Thank you to everyone, especially for the super chats, but also for all of you who interacted. Hopefully I answered enough of your questions as well. I know I didn't get to all of them, um, but uh, you know, I feel like doing this for two hours is, is still pretty good. You know, most other live streamers don't seem to go this long. So hopefully you enjoyed the, uh, you know, the answers I did give and uh, yeah, thank you guys very much for watching. Please continue to stay safe and healthy out there uh, as things continue to get crazier and crazier. Um, but yeah, thanks for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one. Take care.